And we are live. What's up, guys? Welcome to FedEx. Today, we're going to be covering the DC Sniper. You guys have been waiting for this one for a minute. Let's get into it. I was a special agent with Homeland Security Investigations, okay, guys? HSI. The cases that I did mostly were human smuggling and drug trafficking. No one else has these documents, by the way. Here's what FedEx covers. Dr. Lafredo confirmed lacerations due to stepping on glass. Murder investigation. See him reaching in his jacket. You don't know. And he's positioning. Been on February 13, 2019. You are facing two counts of premeditated murder. Racketeering and Rico conspiracy. Young, young slime life here and after referred to as YSL. The defendants is, uh, six nine. And then this is Billy Seiko right here. Now, when they first started, guys, six nine ran. I'm a fed. I'm watching this music video. You know, I'm bobbing my head like, hey, this shit lit. But at the same time, I'm pausing. Oh wait, who this? Right? Oh, who's that in the back? Firearms and violent crimes, aka Pusha T, violated. In order to stay away from the victim, Trapper Pusha T arrested after shooting at King of Diamonds, Miami Strip Club, injured one this person. Is the, this is the one that that's gonna fuck him up because this gun is not traceable. Well, it happened at the gun range. Here's your boy, 42 Doug, right here on the left. Okay. Sex trafficking and sex crimes. Yeah, they can effectively link him to paying an underage girl. I'm gonna love my fifth right, right. And well, the first bomb went off right here. Suspect to set down a backpack at the site of the second explosion. Inspired by Al Qaeda. Two terrorists, their brothers, the Zokar Sarnev and Tamer Lin Sarnev. When the cartel shipped drugs into the country. As this guy got arrested for um, espionage, okay, trading secrets with the Russians for monetary compensation. The largest corrupt police bust in New Orleans history. The days of the police are gone. gone. So he was in this bad boy. We're going to go over his past, the gang ties, so that this all makes sense. All right, guys, we are live. What's up? Welcome to FedEx. Um, <clears throat> so today we're going to be covering the DC snipers, a.k.a. the Beltway snipers. You guys have been requesting this one for a very long time. I apologize for the delay in us starting so late. Uh, I ain't going to lie to you guys. I woke up super late today because uh, it's been a, it's been a long week, man. And I didn't sleep much. So uh, definitely slept quite a bit yesterday uh, leading into today. And I wasn't sure what topic we were going to cover. So I said, you know what? You guys have been asking for a DC sniper forever. Let me go ahead and uh, do a bunch of research. I had already researched this case. Uh, but the main thing that was kind of what was holding me back was there wasn't many good documentaries on it. A lot of them suck. So I was able to find a good one that's more from a law enforcement perspective. And we're going to get into that. But real quick, I got a special guest with me. Well, I, not so special anymore. You guys see her all the time. Angie, can you introduce yourself to the people? Hi, guys. Uh, it's Angie. It's me again. Hang on. Let me put my bandana down. So, <laughs> oh, um, God. All the jokes are coming now. <laughs> um, yeah, we're back. Uh, we're com we're we will be, be covering the DC Sniper. We watched a documentary a while ago, but we didn't like it. Remember? Yes. So, yeah. Finally, Mario, Mario actually found a very good one that I was like getting into it before we start this and then he switched it to the one that we're gonna watch now so i'm kind of i'm kind of boomed and i hope this one is like good because i haven't watched it so yeah that's how she meant bummed guys bummed because you said boom they're like wait what what's the boom bum, boom bum, bum, bummed out boom, bum. bummed out the same thing yeah well, anyways one, um, one is getting boom you know what i'm saying like <laughs> but go ahead um what a lame joke Mario. Right, well, okay lame. whatever um I hope you guys are keeping like tuned with the Mafia series that we're like broadcasting yes. every Thursday. Uh, also follow Fedit on Instagram. It's at Fedit uh, dot eighteen eleven. Okay, and I'll be like reading your requests and everything there. Actually, a big part of the reason why we're doing this one is because you guys have been asking for the DC sniper yes. for quite a bit of time, for a long time. Um, I, like I said before, what kind of held us back was like crappy documentaries, not wanting to hit co get copyright, all this other stuff. But I think I found one that won't, that's uh, good and also not going to hit us with copyrights. But um, real quick announcements, because I see some of you guys are asking some things in the chat right now. 9-11, um, yes, we're going to cover 9-11 with Ryan Dawson on May 5th. Mark your guys' calendars. What I'll probably do is I'll probably broadcast it on this channel and Fresh and Fit at the same time, because as you guys know, I did extensive videos on 9-11. I covered both. The official story with, um, you know, obviously bin Laden, Al Qaeda, how the FBI solved the case, etc. And then I also did an unofficial version where we covered all the conspiracy theories of it being controlled demolition, inside job, etc. But there's an angle that Ryan Dawson uh, and us are going to discuss that no one discusses, which concerns them boys. And also, um, 
a name that rhymes with Laudi Berbia. Y'all know what I'm saying. <laughs> Laudi uh, Larabia, whatever. Okay. So we're going to be covering that angle as well, um, which I saw in a lot of these 9-11 truther videos. No one ever covers these other forces that were involved in, allegedly involved in the 9-11 stuff. Um, we're going to be bringing out, you know, FBI documents, declassified documents from uh, NSA, CIA, et cetera. And especially the FBI docs are going to be the most important for, through FOIAs. So this isn't necessarily just going to be, uh, you know, a tinfoil hat fest. It's going to be very factually based. OK, guys. Um, so it's going to be extensive. I predict that that's going to be at least a two to three hour broadcast with uh, with Dawson. Uh, we'll start it on YouTube and then we're definitely going to have to go over to uh, Rumble once we start talking about um, them boys, if you know what I'm saying. Um, <clears throat> and then as far as uh, the mafia stuff. We've covered so far, the first episode was the hierarchy and, you know, terms, organization, etc. Gives you like a 101 on how the mafia is in the United States. And we also went over the history of uh, Sicily, then coming on over to the United States and the Prohibition area, etc. Then we went into the Gambino family. Then we did the Lucchese family. Next, we're probably going to do the Bananos. And the reason why I'm pushing, uh, I know you guys have been wanting the Columbos for a Columbo, while. Yeah. The reason why I'm pushing that back is because we're actually having Michael Francis on the show. I think May 17th is when we're going to have him on. So I want to kind of have uh, the Colombo crime family done around the time that we interview him. Uh, also so I can have the most accurate stuff, because as you guys know, Michael Francis was a capo for the uh, Colombo crime family back in the 70s and 80s, uh, way back in the day. Um, and then what other announcements? I'm trying to think, Angie, we got. Uh... I'm just very excited for Michael Francis. Yes, um, I'm trying to watch like most of his content. So yes. we won't ask him like the same questions that everyone has asked him already. So we're going to do that. We're going to. We're gonna like keep it real. Yes. Sort of. So yeah, that's happening. I'm very excited. Uh, do you mention the Ryan Dawson thing as well? Yes. Yes, you did. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, those are like the main announcements that we have for you guys. Bam. All right. So I'll hit some of these chats before we get into it. Already got 1,100 plus you guys in here. So do me a favor, like the video, subscribe to the channel. Oh, also Donna Market, you guys, we just hit 150k yes. subs. Yes. All right. Yes. We just hit 150,000. So on on this channel. <laughs> So I really appreciate that. Uh, um, you know, like I said, this channel, guys, surprisingly does take a good amount of my time uh, because researching these cases takes a long time, right? A lot of times we're doing yeah. cases um, of things that aren't necessarily fair, federal jurisdiction, especially the serial killer cases. Those take a lot of time uh, because, you know, serial killers, a lot of times are state cases, guys. The feds don't really investigate serial murders. We might come in and assist, but they don't necessarily, the lead agency on it nine out of 10 times is going to be the state. Why? Because the state focuses on murders. Um, but yeah, it's been great. You know, um, I might bump it up where we might do three videos a week for y'all. Maybe I do some reactions to like shootings. I noticed that you guys really enjoy it when we do the tactical breakdowns, especially with these school, um, these mass shooter cases that I've been doing where we look at the body cam footage and analyze it. So I might do something similar to that. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see what we can do here. As you guys know, fresh if it takes priority. Um, but this channel definitely is fun as well. It just takes a lot of time uh, for only two videos a week. Uh, Jose Medino goes, Shout out, Myron, all the way from Waco, Texas. Hope you cover the Waco siege soon. Yes, we are. We um, are covering, yes, yeah. Waco is going to be covered. Um, me and Angie literally just finished um, watching the uh, the Netflix series on it. And I called it back then when it was like number three in the United States. I was like, watch, w Waco, they're going to request it. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, you, lo and behold, you guys have been Yeah, you guys were requesting it. it. So don't worry. We're definitely going to cover uh, the Waco siege. Absolutely. That's coming. Uh, hi, Lord Myron. Will you cover Jennifer Dulo's CT case? Also, what are your thoughts on a sales job? Uh, sales is a good way to get your foot in the door and learn how to be um, personable and speak to people, and it'll help you out with girls as well. Um, and Jennifer Dulo's case, CT case, I never heard of it, but we can write that down. Uh, Kev's Garage, update on that JFK video. Good question, my friend. Um, we're going to cover John F. Kennedy after we cover 9-11 with Ryan Dawson. Um, a lot of you guys are younger, and some of you guys may not even be familiar with uh, the John F. Kennedy situation but that definitely uh is a very complex situation that's probably going to take two to three hours to explain because there was a bunch of different hands involved in him being assassinated as you guys know late last year i think they declassified another section of the jfk file and it's pretty much established now at this point that the cia was involved in his death uh, tucker carlson talked about this uh, a couple months back, I think back it was November because he was he was he was assassinated on November 22nd. I want to say like 1963. Um, so 
Uh, they declassified the documents now to a degree, and you can see that the CIA was involved. We're going to talk about that with Ryan Dawson as well. But I mean, if I'm going to break it down in a certain number of components, uh, number one, organized crime was involved because Sir John F. Kennedy definitely was going super hard on La Cosa Nostra back then. And we talked about that a little bit in the first episode of uh, The Mafia. Um, it was um, them boys. And then also it was uh, intelligence agencies that were involved in John F. Kennedy's assassination. So we're definitely going to talk about that as well. That will also probably have to be partly done on Rumble because them boys, as you guys know. Uh, Camp two times. Martin, have you seen the latest <laughs> Jubilee episode, Cops vs. Ex-Criminals? I know they're going crazy in the chat, right? Uh, debate about if cops should be disarmed, if is policing necessary, is crime justified, etc. No, I did not see it. Uh, Ryoko, been watching Feta 1811 recently. I can't get enough uh, of it. I'm mad I didn't start sooner, but I'm glad that I have a lot to watch now. Don DeMarco, we got you, my friend. Don't worry about it. Um, so a, a person just asked uh, if we can get a playlist. Uh, Myron actually made a playlist for the Mafia series, you guys. Yes. So you can, guy, you can go check it out. Yes, it's I, cool. I definitely made one for y'all. Yeah. It's uh, I made a couple playlists for you guys um, so you guys can easily find the, the content. Here, I'll show you guys real fast what it looks like. Can you pull up the next chat for me, uh, Angie, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, okay. This is what it looks like, by the way, guys. Um, so you come on down, right? Here's the channel, right? And you come down, most popular videos and all most recent videos, right? All of them are here. Then I got the Sunday videos that we do, which are always live streams. Then I got the um, Thursday videos, which are always pre recorded, which we've been doing the Gambino family, etc. Then I got a whole playlist for y'all for infamous serial killers Jeffrey Dahmer, John Wayne Gacy, Ted Bundy, mm -hmm. uh, this, the um, Zodiac, which actually is one of my favorite ones that I covered. This one was four plus hours long. Um, the Night Stalker, the Green River Killer, um, Railroad Killer, the Unabomber, the Toy Box Killer, the BTK. Yo, a lot of content here, man. Ed Gein. Like, uh, we did all of them. And then here, if you guys come on down, I just created this playlist, I think, yesterday. Um, here's the Italian Mafia, right? It starts with, obviously, the Origins. Then we got the Gambino crime family with John Gotti, et cetera. Then the Lucchese's. Then we got the 9-11 situation, right? We go all the way back to 1993 with the World Trade Center bombing. Then uh, how 9-11 happened and the FBI solved it. Then we talk about Osama bin Laden and how the CIA found him. And then I had another video on how the SEAL Team 6 killed him, but they took that down on YouTube, which is lame. I'll find a way to re-upload that for y'all. Don't worry. Because um, I retried re-uploading, and they were like, no, no. They gave me the big... Uh, nope. And then we got then we go into the conspiracy theories. I did a three-part on the documentary, The New Pearl Harbor, um, which is a five-hour documentary, and I reacted to it and broke it down with y'all. And then uh, the last part of this is going to be the Ryan Dawson interview um, which we're going to cover <laughs> the angles that everyone else is too scared to cover concerning them boys and Loud Arabia, if y'all know what I'm saying. Uh, and then, yeah, man. And then obviously all the other channels. So go ahead and make sure to subscribe to Fresh Print CEO, Fresh Fit Clips, and obviously Fresh and Fit. Um, but yeah, guys, uh, what else here do I have? Oh, going back to the chats, my bad. Yeah. So, uh, so we got here various layers, big bossing. Have a great night, sir. Keep up the great work. I appreciate that, man. Uh, G Fitness goes, when will you uh, be breaking down Aaron Hernandez? That's also oh, on the list. Don't worry. Yeah, I've been asking requested. for that one for a while, too. Yeah, yeah we're going to do that one as well. Um, what else? Uh, we got JR Choi. Shout out to you, Choi. He goes, Myron, do you believe that if... What the heck? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, what? All right. He's trolling. What the we'll fuck? go on to the next one. Okay. <laughs> Honey Bones goes, Salam, brother. This is to help show my appreciation for you helping me because uh, become the best wife I can be. Alhamdulillah. God bless you and the FNF crew. Thank you so much. Aww. I appreciate that. Shout out to you and uh, your marriage. Uh, shukran Jazeelan. Fresh the handsome lawnmower. Uh, five more lawns. Let's go. Okay, I got you, bro. Because <laughs> Fresh said he identifies a lawnmower to troll all these people that are saying that they identify as a woman. Uh, Michael Mistro. Appreciate that. Super sticker. And then what else we got here? Why Angie sounds like she's out of breath. Lose. <laughs> Because she's been going to the gym, guys. That's why she had a shape. You have anything you want to tell the people? No, mm -hmm. I'm I'm not out of shape. But I'm, yes, I've been going to the gym and I'm very like happy with my, you know, what what do you say? Like, I, I don't know how to say it. But anyways, yeah, I'm not. I don't sound like I'm out of breath. <laughs> what the hell? That's crazy. <laughs> anyways, Mara, why do, you, why do you have that face? Because every time I bring you to the airport, you're like, ooh, ooh, try to keep up and you can't keep up. Because I'm- I gotta carry her bags for her guys, if y'all wanna know the truth, cause she's so slow and she'd be getting tired and be like, Ugh. I'm like, man, come on, man. And I just like take her shit and we'll just, we just because go. I'm weight, uh, because I'm carrying like half my weight. That's crazy. Uh, 
bro. I have to carry your bags too. So it, no, no. Well, yeah, you. That makes it even worse when you carry them because then we're we go slow. Then I just take yours and I say, let's go. Come on. So yeah, Angie, she's going to gym though. She's trying to get in better shape. Michael Meestroke, dollar. Thank you so much. Oh, uh, you didn't read this one. Oh shit. I think. All right, go back to it then. When and you... guys, thank you so much for the support. Like I said before. You don't have to donate a dollar to the channel. Just like the video, subscribe to the channel. That's all I ask. Let's get this channel up to 200K. When are you going to do Griselda Blanco, a.k.a. Godmother? Okay, that's a... <laughs> oh, man. Okay. That, again, and it's... Uh, okay, so Griselda Blanco, they're talking... This Now we're getting into Miami, uh, Colombian drug trafficking. Uh -huh. That's going to have to be a series by itself, too, guys. Uh, cocaine Cowboys and getting into that whole thing. If I'm going to cover that, that's going to be a series as well. That's going to be a three- to five-part series easily <laughs> if we're going to cover the whole cocaine wave here in the miami which actually i'd be happy to do that um when it comes to uh drug smuggling that is one of my uh specialties so i can definitely cover that but that's going to be a bunch of series but good suggestion i uh, will write that one down michael me stroke thank you so much okay, what else yeah. do we got here and we already got 1600 you guys in here by the way like the video subscribe to the channel love the coverage of these syndicates salute thank you i mean danielle appreciate that uh whenever you guys say tradcon my brain immediately goes to decepticon had me thinking about megatron <laughs> <laughs> now it means traditional conservative okay michael make sure to uh, thank you so much michael uh 716 locks can you do the bike path grapist upstate new york never heard of that that's the first time i've seen that yeah, request me too. uh shout out to the irs your breakdowns on these cases are legendary keep up the great work w lord gains w angie for being a great helpmate yeah shout Thank out to angie you. helping out uh secret vlogger 19 born in america before in high school diploma can i still become a special agent in the future uh so i'll tell you this so you're going if you're going to be born in America before in high school diploma, can I still? Yeah, you're fine. But you're going to have if you have dual citizenship, you're going to have to renounce your other citizenship. Um, and you're probably going to have I think you uh, one of the prerequisites for a lot of agencies is you've had to have lived in the United States for between one to five years consecutively. And you haven't you can't have lived abroad. So I think you'll be wow. OK. But uh, but just make sure and, or be prepared that if you want to get any government service, especially something where you have a clearance, you will have to renounce any other citizenships you hold. That's uh, great. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Nova T. Martin, I'm a former prosecutor and currently a defense attorney in Houston. Watch Fed religiously. Would love to work with you, brother. Any way I, I can apply to contribute to the team? Hmm. Interesting. Mm. Uh, you know what? DM Angie right now. Fed at 1811. And uh, I'll ask you some questions and see what, what we could do here. Um, I don't know what kind of... If, if you say prosecutor, I don't know if you mean federal. I'm going to assume you're probably an ADA, assistant district attorney. Uh, but if anyone's an AUSA... Let me know. I'd be happy to work with a, a AUSA on this channel. Uh, past the Foley's goes them boys. Yeah, bro. You already know them boys. <laughs> yeah, we can't even mention them on YouTube. Uh, does the BAU from Criminal Minds really exist? I've never seen the show, so I don't what know. What is a BAU? Do you know? I'm not, I'm not sure. But uh, I will tell you guys, a lot of these um, crime TV shows are somewhat, uh, they have a lot of fictional fiction in mm -hmm. them. Uh, when y'all going to do Men in Black, not the movie? Probably not. <laughs> what's that i don't know what he means by that probably some like cia crap uh what else uh joint ceo network need more money to join to join yours lol don't worry about it guys and yeah i gotta advertise the myron <laughs> mindset more um i've just been really tied up so i want to launch it uh fully on uh probably after fresh finishes his stuff what else do we got okay that's it we're caught up cool yes all right guys so for some of you guys that are just joining we already got 7, 1600 plus y'all in here today we're going to be covering the dc sniper guys you guys have been requesting this one for a long time the dc snipers aka also known as the beltway sniper so let's go ahead and jump Oops, sorry uh jump right into it okay so uh the dc sniper attacks dc sniper attacks also known as the beltway sniper attacks were a series of coordinated shootings that occurred during the weeks uh three weeks in october 20 2002 throughout the washington metropolitan area consisting of the District of Columbia, Maryland, and Virginia. Ten people were killed and three others were critically wounded. The snipers were John Allen Muhammad, this guy right here, okay, uh, who he was born December 31st, 1960, uh, died November 10th, 2009 by lethal ingestion, was an American convicted murderer who, along with his partner and accomplice Lee Boyd Malvo, then age 17, carried out the D.C. sniper attacks of October 2002, killing 10 people. Muhammad and Malvo were arrested in connection with the attacks on October 24, 2002, following tips from alert citizens. Although the actions of the two individuals were classified by the media as psycho uh, psych psychopathy, psych psychopathy, I'm sorry, attributable to serial killer characteristics, whether or not their uh, psycho psychopathy. psychopathy meets this classification or as a spree killer is debated by researchers. And then th th here was his partner, Lee Boyd Malvo, okay, um, uh, so he committed a series of murders, etc. Let me see if I can get an image of this guy. Uh, Lee Boyd Malvo. I'll show you guys. He was a kid at the time when he got arrested. Yeah, this is him. 
Well, this is him now. He's an adult now. He was 17, But, but this right? is him back in the day, guys. All right? And he's on the thumbnail as well for some of you guys that are wondering. Um, and then here is the FBI's website right here where they actually have a whole page dedicated to these guys. And <clears throat> when they caught them. Um, and actually, I didn't know this, but one of the victims was actually an FBI analyst, uh, Linda Franklin. So rest in peace to her, who was, uh, you know, killed by a single bullet while leaving a home improvement store in Virginia with her husband. Um, and the FBI absolutely was involved in this investigation. The three main agencies were uh, the county police in this situation, the ATF, a.k.a. Air, Al Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives, and the FBI. And they really dedicate a lot of personnel to this case. I think over 400 agents were involved in this investigation, guys, back in 2002, um, because one of, you know, obviously, for, number one, it was a national security thing. It had a lot of press. And then number two, one of their own were murdered uh, from these killers. And another thing, too, real quick, because I was uh, I was 12 years old when these shootings were going down. And just to give you guys an atmosphere of someone that actually lived through it. Back in 2002, guys, keep in mind, 9-11 had occurred a year prior, and there was a lot of hysteria when it came to terrorism, foreign acts, uh, foreign um, foreign individuals going ahead, attacking the United States, etc. So when this happened, I remember it was all over the news. It was going crazy, and everyone was terrified, guys. The whole Northeast was terrified because they didn't know if these guys were going to be limited to the um, DMV area or if they were going to go to a New York City, to a Boston, etc. So, um, and, and the thing is too, this is prior to the age of social media, but this thing was everywhere. And the press actually had a very, how do I say this? Disturbing effect on the investigation, which we're going to talk about here, but they actually impeded this case significantly in some situations and antagonized situations where shootings happened that might've not necessarily occurred had the press just kept their nose out of the business. But as usual, you know, they want to go ahead, get the story, break the story make a lot of money because back then this was the only way people were getting their news. We don't have this. We didn't have the same environment that we have now where there's all this independent media, you know, people laugh at CNN and Fox news nowadays, but back then they were the Kings guys. You could not get your own. You, you could not get your news. What if it did not come from the mainstream media or a newspaper? So that's a very important distinction for you guys to understand of the climate back then. So the mainstream uh, narrative and the mainstream news was the only way people were informed of what the hell was going on. And when I tell you that there was mass hysteria, people were terrified. This was a nationwide manhunt, nationwide coverage. It, it, it doesn't do it justice. It, it was everywhere. And back this then. was like right after 9-11. Yes, a year later. Right after. Yeah. This is crazy. So the country was already super sensitive um, of to, course. to this type of stuff because no one knew what was going on. I remember... People were saying, oh, yeah, these are some crazy white people, man. Well, black people don't go around and shoot people for, and snipe them. But then next thing they know, stupid. it actually was uh, two African-American guys. So um, and that, so that's just to give you all kind of a little bit of a climate of what it was like back then. It was, it was unprecedented, guys, unprecedented. Um, and hell, there's a reason why all y'all requested it, because clearly, it, you know, it was shifting. Um, Junior goes, since you're doing Cocaine Cowboys, don't forget Willie Falcon and Sal Magulta. Exactly, which is, that's exactly what came to mind. When she, uh, when he mentioned Griselda Black, I was like, okay, if I'm going to do that, then I'm going to have to do it correctly. I can't just cover her and not cover all the other uh, traffickers that were involved in that situation. That's going to be a multi-part series as well. Uh, JB, I live in Beemore. I remember this happening as a kid. Yeah, so bro. you were 12 and you were living in Connecticut yes. back then? Uh, yeah. So this, that's I was pretty, like in middle school. That's pretty close to Washington, isn't it? Not? It's like four hours away, but... Um, But the thing is, is that everyone was scared that like, yo, these guys are because when they were doing the shootings, it was like in random places. So everyone was terrified that like they would go to like a New York or to a major city yeah. in the Northeast and make it happen. And like especially major cities were super on high alert because. Let's be honest here, you know, when terrorists attack the United States, they're not going to attack in the middle of nowhere. Right. They're not going to attack in bumblefuck Iowa. They're going to go attack <laughs> a major U.S. city to send a message. Right. Yeah. So um, everyone was terrified. Um, and then also, speaking of which, real quick, just to give you guys a quick little reminder. Guys, I covered, um, and this actually, it's amazing to me. It is the 10-year anniversary of the Boston Marathon bombings two weeks ago. Um, I covered the Boston Marathon bombing, guys, on this show. Um, so go back and look through on on the on the playlist. But I, I covered it, you know, with the, I think I watched the it. Sarnav brothers and everything else like that. Because I was living in Boston at the time. When, uh, when that terrorist attack happened. And you guys want to hear an interesting story. Uh, what ended up happening? So check this out. Man, this brings back memories. 
2013, yep. April, I want to say it was like uh, on or about April 15, 20, 2013. I'm a uh, senior in college, guys, and I'm doing my thesis paper to get my bachelor's degree, right? And I'll major in criminal justice. I was writing a paper on how Homeland Security had done a pretty good job of staving off terrorist attacks in the United States since its creation in 2003. Um, and I was making an argument saying that there had not been a successful terrorist attack on U.S. soil since 9 11. And I, and I also used to back up my argument a bunch of terrorist attacks that were stopped, right? And then I fucking get a phone call. I'll never forget this shit. I get a phone call from my supervisor, and I was an intern with Homeland Security at the time uh, to become with HSI. I get a call, and he's like, hey, uh, what are you doing? And mind you, I had my phone off. I had the TV off. I was, like, focused on writing this paper because I had to get that shit done. It was doing, like, a day or so, right? Everything turned off. I was, like, in my room. It was all dark and stuff. I had the windows closed. I'm sitting in my dorm just typing this thing up because, you know, I went crammed in to the last minute. And he's like, and it was weird for him to call me in the middle of the day because he knew it was like finals week. And he's like, hey, are you all right? I was like, yeah, I'm good. What's what's going on? I'm over here thinking like, fuck, like, did I do something? Am I stupid? Like, was I supposed to be at work or something? What's going on here? I'm all terrified. <laughs> and he's like, a bomb just went off at the at the uh, at the finish line for the for the marathon. And mind you guys, Northeastern was only about maybe a couple blocks away from where the um, the bombing happened. So. Uh, so he thought like maybe I was there watching or whatever. Cause anytime like an attack happens guys, uh, in the federal government, they typically do, uh, what you call like a, like a head count almost like they call everybody, make sure everybody's okay. Where, what happened, whatever. So he called me and I was like, what the fuck? And then I like, you know, turn my phone on and I see like all this news coverage that a bomb, two bombs that went off at the Boston marathon bombing finish line, which is on Boylston street. And, uh, yeah, it was it was crazy, man. It was it was wild. Um, and then I had to go back to my paper and I delete that entire last paragraph and I had to rewrite it. <laughs> so give myself an L. Because I knew right then and there, I was like, yeah, this is a terrorist attack. I didn't even need the FBI. To, it, FBI, I think like two days later, ended up um, announcing that it was a, indeed a terrorist attack. But I knew right then and there, I was like, bro, it's a wrap. It, this, this is an L for Myron. Uh, okay, so uh, certified Tyrol goes Myron. My brother wants to be a special agent starting college in the fall. Should he go for accounting or criminal justice? Go for accounting. 100% go for accounting. Uh, secret vlogger, lived in the U.S. 10 plus years, also speak a rare language. Cool. Uh, but b speaking a rare language isn't as important as speaking uh, in-demand language. Russian, Mandarin, Chinese, Arabic. Those are languages that will help you a lot when it comes to getting involved in, uh, whether it be FBI or any type of it. Uh, Those are the most spoken government. languages in the world as well. Which one? Well, number one is Mandarin. Second, it's English, I think. Yeah. Third one, I think it's Spanish. Fourth one will say Portuguese, and five, it will, it, I think it's Arabian. Okay. I think I checked. Like you're not sure about the last one. Uh, supporting the show, these streams are not only entertaining but educational. Keep them coming, sir. Appreciate that, my friend. Uh, okay, so let's go back. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and cover this documentary here, guys. Um, it's called Hunting the DC Sniper, which I really enjoyed. I was watching parts of it, but the reason why I like this one uh, more than the others is because. Um, it has more of a law enforcement angle, which I think anytime you want to really get a, uh, into the, like the details and juice of a case, you should always talk to the investigators that were involved in the case versus like random reporters. Cause let's keep it a thousand reporters don't know shit. Um, <laughs> now to be safe here, I got other documentaries ready to go. Right. In case, you know, YouTube hits me with like, as you guys know, they'll be like, Oh, it looks like you're st like, you're streaming, uh, something that's copyright, blah, blah, blah. And they like turn the stream off for a little bit and then they turn it back on. So if they do do that. We're live on Twitch right now as well, uh, and I have other backups. So I'm ready. Today, I am ready. <laughs> so uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and play this documentary. And uh, we'll pause it, obviously, for commentary, and I'll give you guys more insight uh, and to explain any law enforcement jargon that might come in. So uh, anything you got, Angie, before we get into it? Nothing? No. Okay, she eats the banana. Cool. So, you, you know the jokes are coming, by the way, for that, right? That you're eating a banana on camera. Well, the jokes are eating yeah, a banana. They're coming no matter what. So it is what it is. All right, let's get into it, guys. But this October, everything changed. A beautiful evening, um, very well lit, crowded parking lot. Anytime after five o'clock, people are coming to buy their groceries post work. Um, and it was just a, sort of a normal day. One of the cashiers there, she'd been standing doing her job and a bullet had come she had, it, close by her head 40 minutes later that wednesday evening there was another shooting 
A man walking across a busy supermarket car park was shot in the back and killed. Police were unnerved by the random murder and the skill of the executioner. I didn't delve into a lot of detail. And just so you guys know, the, uh, the main mastermind behind this, uh, John Allen Muhammad, uh, born John Allen Williams, um, he was a sharpshooter in the military. OK, uh, he wasn't a sniper, but he was a sharpshooter in the military. So that also explains why these guys were so deadly. Uh, sharpshooter, someone that has uh, really proficient um, accuracy with the firearm. And he was and he was uh, awarded like a, he basically got that distinction in the military when you're a sharpshooter. Oh, OK. But it did seem strange. that. In we, other words, you don't miss. We didn't have a lot of evidence. So we didn't really. Anticipate. All right. Chief Charles Moose. Guys, this dude right here. Bruh, I remember as a kid, he was on the news every day talking about the shootings. Now, just so you guys understand, when you are the um, chief, right, of a county or the sheriff, right, depending on whether you're up, you know, north or south of the United States, whatever it may be, anytime crazy stuff like this happens, you are under an enormous amount of pressure to get it done. Because when you're the chief of a county, you are considered the top law enforcement official in that county, right? Now, obviously, you got your Fed and local partners, et cetera. But when you're the sheriff or the chief, whatever, you are looked at as the main guy because you're the uniform, you're the face, it's a political position, you're right under the mayor, et cetera. So uh, sometimes under, uh, you know, you, you're dealing with the governor directly sometimes if it's huge. So you're put under an enormous amount of pressure to give updates on the investigation while simultaneously concealing parts of the investigation so that the investigators can do their job. So it's a very tricky dance, guys, whenever you have a case that has this kind of media attention to it, where you want to divulge enough to give the, to give the audience um, an insight as to what's going on and tell them what to do and make them feel some sort of relief. But at the same time, you don't want to divulge enough where it'll impact your investigators' chances of catching the bad guys. So it's a very tough position to be in as a sheriff, man, because you are the face of the investigative effort and all the good and the bad is going to befall you. And this guy definitely uh, inadvertently became an overnight celebrity because of this case. Dissipate the uh, Thursday morning. Seven forty-one. I got a page that said a man had been killed on a lawnmower. The lawnmower had exploded. Was how it actually came across the page. I thought that was very unusual. James Buchanan, a gardener, was shot in the back and killed whilst mowing a customer's lawn. Um, when people call nine one one on this situation, by the way, guys, they thought like he had like got cut by the lawnmower because there was so much blood. So they thought it was like a lawnmower accident or whatever. So when they called 911, they were saying, like, I think it's a lawnmower accident. He might have chopped himself up or something like that. But when police arrived on scene, they realized that he had actually been shot while he was mowing his lawn. And this is what caused people so much fear. Random people doing, random, you know, typical errands were getting killed out of nowhere. And there was no rhyme or reason. There was no connection between them. There was no um, demographic that was being killed specifically. This, the shooters didn't discriminate. They shot at everyone. But the pages were coming through fairly quickly. So I get a page. There's been a shooting at the mobile station. Yes, guys, you got a page. Cell phones were not really a thing like that back then in the day, man. It was a whole different time. <laughs> People were getting pages back then. Then, 31 minutes later, Prem Kumar Walakar, a taxi driver, was killed by a single gunshot to the chest. Maybe it's a terrorist, for real. I mean, you know, no, they haven't ruled it in or out. I mean, it, it could be the new wave of terrorism. What better way to terrorize a neighborhood than to start? Yeah, back then, if you want to make a phone call, guys, you have to go to a pay phone that, were in the, that was like on the corner or whatever it may be. Like, I know that's like, you guys are like, well, probably like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, oh, hell no. but back then, guys, like cell phones were kind of like a luxury. Not many people had them and they didn't have the same uh, power and reliance that they have now. Like if you if you did have a phone back then, it was like a piece of shit flip phone, 
couldn't do nothing on it. Like ringtones were maybe just starting to become a thing back then. So yeah, you were using pay phones if you needed to make a phone call on the fly. Wow, what was so funny? You're reading the, you, the chat. You really scared me this time with that sound. Oh, the hell, the hell not. I was so fucking so watching the video and then you... <laughs> killing people at random in different places, all within a given you know area. Twenty-five minutes later, outside a post office, Sarah Ramos was sitting reading on a bench. She was killed by a bullet to the head. It was so you guys can see literally no there's there's no difference here excuse me there's no rhyme or reason why he's shooting he's shooting and killing people it's like random people doing random things so that's what had everyone so scared is that this guy similar to the night stalker by the way didn't have a certain type of person that he was going after right you look at other serial killers like john wayne gacy or ted bundy ted bundy like you know, younger women between 18 and 25 that had darker hair, typically college age students use the same method, right? Oh, my arm is broken. Help me out. Right. Or um, yeah, John Wayne Gacy, like teenage boys, right. That he would get to employ for his, uh, for his business. But the, but like, just like the night stalker, which also had California and a frenzy back in the eighties, these dudes were just attacking and shooting anyone. And that makes it way harder for the police to solve the crime because they don't have a track record and they don't know what to look for. Do you have something, Angie? Yeah, the the uh, like the connection with between all these killers were like compulsion, basically. Yes. So I don't know. I don't know how to see these guys. Exactly. So no one had a clue what these guys were. Like FBI profilers were, were puzzled. It's like it was a ghost moving methodically through the county, shooting at people indiscriminately. And it was, we couldn't proactively get in front of what he was doing. It's like we're always moving behind. He lives right in this area somewhere. He's too familiar with it. He lives right around here. I don't know if he's on foot at this point or what, but um, he's really sick. Evil. For a lot of people, it just kind of said everyone's at risk from a Historical context, generally serial killers go at a much different pace. Chief Moose and I looked at each other. We looked at each other such as, God, please don't let it be another one. An hour and 20 minutes later, another shooting. Laurie Ann Lewis Rivera a child carer, was shot in the back and killed whilst vacuuming out her people carrier. So, so as you guys can see, he's over here shooting, wow, Caucasian men, Indian men, Caucasian women, Hispanic women. He didn't give a shit who he was shooting. So this obviously had the police going crazy, bro. And there wasn't much time in between shootings. So as they were, you know, arriving on scene to try to deal with one crime scene, they had another one literally hours later. Committed Montgomery County Police Chief Charles Moose had headed some major cases in his time, but he had never handled anything of this magnitude before. Nothing like this has ever happened in Montgomery County. Uh, this is a very safe community. Uh, our homicide rate just increased by 25% in one day. Captain. Yo, that is crazy. Your murder rate goes up 25% in one day. Dude, that is literally like, like a political, like killer right there. Like, you know, you, the mayor, y'all want to get reelected. Oh, murder rate just went up 25%. That my friends. Big L. That is bad so you can imagine <laughs> had him and the mayor and everybody else just fucking sweating like god damn man nancy demi had been in her job working alongside chief moose for only three weeks when the killing started you don't know any more except for that there are various genders races ages um that are of individuals that have been victims of shootings that's what we have right now but all anybody could do at that time was confirm 
confirm that we had a victim, confirm that they were shot, confirm that we had witnesses to the victims falling. But that's that doesn't help the public. That doesn't even help the police. Chief Moose put all 1,100 Montgomery County police officers on high alert. It just seemed as though the shootings were going to never stop. It wasn't clear, you know, where and when the next strike would be. And that's horrible for you guys as an investigator, guys, because the thing is, is that for you to solve the case, since you don't really have a pattern or anything, you need another crime to occur so that you can go ahead and just get piece by piece each crime scene and try to link things. So it's kind of the catch 22 where you don't want another crime to happen, but you need another crime to happen so that you can figure out who the hell these guys are, because each crime scene is offering such little evidence that you need more and more crime scenes to be able to piece it together. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of the situation that investigators face when they're dealing with serial killers or spree killers or everything else like that, is they need more crimes to occur to find these guys. Everyone was at risk. These murders had something to do with everyone because they were just- and Here's the mayor. You know, he was sweating as well. He was like, God damn, bro. <laughs> I might not get reelected. Mama mia. People just doing ordinary things and they lost their life because of it. Duncan, mayor of Montgomery County and Moose's boss, was identified as being a potential target for the sniper. He was assigned armed bodyguards as protection. You don't know what the history of the person is. You don't know who's doing it. You don't know if are they living in your community. Did they grow up in your community? We did know. And that's why uh, there was such fear. here. We held our breath, hoping someone else wouldn't be shot. And you sort of wait minute by minute, half hour by half hour, hour by hour. If you can elude for about 400, 500 cops at a time, uh, there's only one person or two people. That's kind of scary. If you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, then it's your time. You know, I think he's planned it. This area, this location, and whoever walks through. That night, Levels of fear in the community rocketed when the sniper moved unexpectedly away from Montgomery County and into the American capital. Okay, so now shit's about to get real. Because it's one thing to operate, you know, in Montgomery County. Obviously, you got people going crazy because you're shooting random people with no rhyme or reason indiscriminately. But now you move into the... Um, <laughs> The United States Capitol of Washington, D.C. Remember, guys, the United States back then was extremely sensitive to terrorism. We had just gotten attacked by 9-11. There was an anthrax hysteria. We're preparing to go to war with Iraq. This was a wild time. So for the shooters to move over to Washington, D.C., the capital of the United States, bro, it just elevated it to a whole other level. Things are about to get wild. The sniper's sixth victim, 72-year-old Pascal Charlot, was shot and killed as he crossed a busy Washington, D.C. street. I've seen gunshot wounds, you know, regarding hunting situations, uh, and this, this, it looked very similar. Uh, I've also seen gunshot wounds in the district that have happened with pistols. I just knew it looked different. Um, I'm not a doctor, so I couldn't really tell if he was going to make it or not. Um, but from what I saw, it was, it was pretty devastating. This individual is still out there. We don't know where this person is. Just as a regular citizen, as a police officer, as anybody who lives in this country, it's, it's devastating to think that this can happen.
Chief Moose. He goes, you might as well get ready. This is going to be, this is going to be a long couple days. Um, and when we left that night, I remember he said, get some sleep, get it quick, because I don't know how much more you're going to get. As the Thursday came to a close. So just so you guys know, anytime something crazy like this happens, whether it's a terrorist attack, you got an active shooter, um, you got someone at large, the agency that's responsible, their personnel, they're not sleeping, dude. Um, and, and I can tell you guys this from personal experience. You got a missing child. You got anything wild going on. You're just not going to go to sleep. You basically have to make things happen in a short amount of time. Because when you're in a response state, which a lot of times these crazy things happen, now you're in a response state, you have to basically get things going immediately and not wait on time. The best thing you can hope for is someone could come in and relieve you for a few hours. So you can just go home, sleep a little bit. You literally wake up, sometimes not even shower, and then go right back to the office and do what you were doing. That's what goes down whenever you have emergency situations like this and panics. And I remember I had a case like this. and I'll talk about this for y'all one day. Um, but I had a case where we had guys using fake Border Patrol units, right, Border Patrol vehicles, to smuggle illegal aliens, aliens into the United States. Now, I know you guys are probably like, wait, hold on, wait, 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 what the... <laughs> the reason why that's such a big problem is that you're using a law enforcement vehicle, which were fake, to smuggle illegal aliens in. Imagine what you can also smuggle in with that. You can smuggle in, obviously, bombs, weapons, bombs. or worse yet, terrorists. And the thing is, a lot of times with terrorists, guys, is they would pay a lot of people that, like, hate the United States or whatever, they would pay premium costs to be smuggled into the United States because they knew, right, that what they would be called, an, you know, they're an exotic, right? If they're from the Middle East or they're from any of these countries that are on the terrorist watch list, they typically pay more to ensure that they get into the United States. So if you got an organization utilizing fake Border Patrol units, right, to smuggle people into the country and they're not getting caught for a while and we finally did uncover it, you're running down leads like crazy, which I'll talk about this case in more details. One of the cases that actually made me grow gray hairs. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and I got pictures and all that other stuff from it. This was back in 2015. I was lead case agent on it, guys. I didn't sleep for like a week. Uh, actually, a few weeks, actually. Um, because we were nailing down every goddamn lead in that investigation because it was a serious national security uh, risk. So um, I'll go over to that in detail, but I can definitely tell y'all, when you have big cases like this from a reactionary standpoint, you're running down every lead, you ain't sleeping. Very stressful situation. Chief Moose and his force had been left to chase a trail of death with few substantive clues. Police thought the sniper was using a high-powered rifle, but the only evidence they had was bullet fragments retrieved. Hit the damn like button, because ain't nobody on YouTube giving you guys this type of insight, this type of breakdown, because ain't nobody on YouTube done this shit before. I've actually done these investigations, guys. So like the goddamn video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. We only got 800 plus likes here. We should be having easily 2,000 likes. There's 2,200 of you guys watching on YouTube alone. So go ahead and like the video, subscribe to the channel. You don't got to donate a dollar to the stream. I just ask that you like the video so it gets pushed in the algorithm because content like this typically gets suppressed, guys. I'm always getting yellow checks on these videos because of the violence and the ooh, terrorism, all that other crap, even though it's educational. Yeah. So like the video, guys. From the victims' bodies. On Friday morning, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, the ATF, confirmed that all the victims had been killed by the same gun. The round being used. All right. Anytime weapons are involved, guys, in an in investigation, especially people getting shot, nine out of ten times, you're going to have to bring the ATF in, uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. I've done podcasts before where I've explained uh, intimately what they do. But long story short, they're the lead agency when it comes to any type of firearms violations. If you want to go ahead and get a gun traced, they're the ones that have the capability of doing something called an e-trace, where they can trace the firearm back based off serial number to the original purchaser. And a lot of the times, if you catch a gun at a crime scene, you won't know how that gun came to be in that criminal situation. So what you could do is, once you trace the gun back to the original purchaser, let's say it was bought 10 years ago from, you know, John XYZ, you go to John XYZ, hey, this gun was found at this crime scene. Uh, can you tell us what you did with it? Oh, I sold it to this individual. Okay, boom. And then it gives you kind of a starting point to begin the investigation and figure out how the gun got into the hands of the criminal that eventually used it to commit the crime. So that is why e-traces are so important. And that's why if you have a gun that has a serial number scratched off, it's a felony offense because it disables the ATF's ability to trace the gun back to the original source and conduct the investigation. The, the type of ammunition was in the 22 caliber family. And right here, Michael Butchard, ATF special agent. So this is probably one of the lead case agents, one of the case agents or someone that was 
intimately involved in this investigation. And that's why I like this documentary is because it's giving you guys insight from the actual investigators that were involved in this case. Meaning the head of the bullet, the projectile that leaves the bullet um, was the diameter of a 22 caliber rifle. It is uh, a pretty damaging round, high velocity, 3,000 feet per second. So, again, it, you won't even know you were already hit before you, you hear the sound. And this is the 223. It's a significantly larger, just to give you an idea, with the 9 millimeter on your left, the 40 caliber in the center, and the 223 round on the right. Bam. You also can see the difference right there. You got the 9 mil, the 40, and then the 223. And just so you guys know, um, most law enforcement agencies now are going back to the 9 millimeter. Uh, you know, most agencies used the, the 40 caliber for several years. I remember when I got on the job, way just side back in 2013, we were using the the, uh, um, the, uh, the gun that you were issued was the six-hour P229 DAK, the long-ass trigger pull. That gun was trash. I immediately bought a Glock uh, once I got on the job and used that instead. Uh, nine mil, because <clears throat> they had they gave you a list of guns that were approved. But uh, all the uh, most of the agencies now, and I think the, the HSI um, issued gun is switched. It's not no longer the P two two nine. But uh, but now a lot of law enforcement agencies are going back to nine mil because what they found was when you do ballistic testing with forty caliber and nine millimeter, there's virtually no difference in uh, the stopping power of the nine millimeter. The only thing is though. You have to have high quality nine millimeter, right? For it to, to be as strong as the 40 caliber, which a lot of the times with law enforcement, they give you the, you know, the hollow points, et cetera. They give you the spear law enforcement rounds. Those are good. Uh, but if you got a good nine, nine, uh, nine millimeter quality, it's equivalent to 40 caliber. And the reason why that's important is because with nine millimeter, you can have more rounds in the, in the magazine, which obviously is very important in a gunfight. And nine millimeter is cheaper than 40 caliber. So as long as you buy good nine millimeter, typically it's the same as a 40. But two, two, three, that's a whole other uh, game. And almost counterintuitive. <laughs> Weapons 101 the in mind. <laughs> police use. Yeah, and, I, and people are probably going to argue with me on that. Like, oh, no, 40 caliber is better. What are you talking about? Blah, blah, blah. They've done literally hundreds, if not thousands, of ballistic tests on this, guys, because, when the, because most eight law enforcement agencies switch to 40 caliber, right? Especially. After the uh, the FBI shooting back in nineteen, I think eighty six, which I covered on this channel as well, by the way. <laughs> that was a pivotal turning point when it comes to law enforcement and weapons. Was the uh, I think it was nineteen eighty six FBI shooting down here in Miami, which I did a whole podcast on that too. You guys should check that out. That's when law enforcement agencies switched from revolvers right over to semi automatic pistols because the FBI ended up chasing these two guys down, getting into a big ass gunfight. And a bunch of agents died because their weapons, quite frankly, just didn't have enough stopping power compared to the people that they were chasing. But to summarize it for all, yes, there's a 9mm 40 caliber debacle going on. But, bro, it's been proven at this point that 9mm is equivalent. That's why all the law enforcement agencies pretty much are switching back. The FBI, HSI, DEA, um, ATF, they're all switching back to 9mm because it just you can carry more rounds and it's cheaper. So it's a W all around. These two rounds which are actually much heavier in terms of the projectile than the 223. The big difference is the speed at which these rounds travel. These rounds are down around 1,500 feet per second, where this round can be anywhere between 3,100 and 3,500 feet per second. The round is very devastating in terms of its speed, its impact, the damage it does. Uh, the best comparison I can give you is it's like the wake of a boat. The faster it goes, the broader the wake behind it. This bullet does essentially the same thing. It enters with a very small hole, but just expands rapidly and does massive internal damage. Speculation was widespread on the sniper's identity. Was he Al-Qaeda, a rogue French Foreign Legion soldier, or a local resident determined to terrorize his neighborhood? That's an understatement. Everyone was going wild. Think it was re uh, related to um, Islamic terrorist groups, right? Islamophobia was in full effect, guys, in 2002 in the United States at this point. Then the mysterious killer struck for the seventh time, 100 miles south of Montgomery County in Virginia. 
So now he hit in three different areas, Montgomery County, Virginia, and Washington, D.C. Bro, the, the police at this point were like, Bumbacat! A woman was shot in a car park. The bullet passed through the open door of her vehicle before piercing her side. Miraculously, she survived. The killer had crossed state lines, and Chief Moose's sniper investigation was no longer solely a local matter. 50 FBI investigators joined the 100 strong Montgomery County detectives to work on the case. The sniper killings had become big news, and the mighty US networks joined local stations outside Montgomery County Police Headquarters. The sniper killings had made the county infamous and its police chief an unwilling celebrity. <laughs> he was sweating. Yeah, the end of June. Working 19 hour days, Chief Moose and Mayor Duncan prepared for the week to come. They agreed that schools would remain open. Well, well this is going to lead to something that might not be so good. Um, Fatality. But you guys will see here in a second. Early on Monday morning, Moose spoke out to reassure the public. Now, guys, just so you understand, keep in mind, there's been several shootings now at this point in three different locations. People are scared to leave their homes, right? So they're saying, hey, you know, because the jo their job is to kind of keep the pandemonium and the fear down. So the last thing they want to do is close the schools down, because if they close the schools down, that's going to basically let the uh, panic, the shooters. Yeah, it's going to create panic mm -hmm. and it's going to basically let the shooters feel like they won because that's what they want. They want things to basically go on their frame and they want people to be terrified. That is the point of terrorism. It's to terrorize the community into doing well, into, into being fearful, not doing what they, what they typically want to do and put pressure on the government to change for their radical uh, beliefs or agendas. Right? So they don't want to close the schools down for obvious reasons. And his job again, as the chief of police is to go ahead and calm the well, chief of the Montgomery County is to calm the community down, which is a very daunting task because your job is to calm the community down while simultaneously not giving up too much information to hurt the investigation. And if you guys notice, all right, I want y'all to pay attention. Anytime there's some crazy situation going on with crime, the mayor, <laughs> in any situation, where there's, uh, you know, New York or whatever it may be, they're typically going to let the, the law enforcement guy do all the talking. And they're just going to be in the back like... So boring. <laughs> And the reason for that is because mayors and politicians never want to be the ones to give the bad news. They're going to get they're going to let the top law enforcement official do it, which nine out of 10 times is going to be the sheriff or the chief of police at that point. Sometimes the Fed will Feds will come in um, and give a little bit of, uh, you know, reference to certain points or whatever. But in general, it almost always falls on the commissioner, the sheriff or whoever the top law enforcement guy is from the local standpoint. When the Boston Marathon bombing happened. You know, uh, I think it was Deval Patrick was the mayor at the time in Boston. Bruh, <laughs> he was letting the commissioner do most of the talking. It was like, uh, yeah, um, we will defeat these guys. Okay, Chief, co commissioner, it's on you. And you just like get out the way and let him handle the rest of it. So as a politician, they want to stay outside <laughs> of giving any type of negative news. Um, so I'll be wanting to oh, ask you yeah, go because ahead. I have it written down here. I, re I was reading because I wasn't even born in this time you know yeah like, so i wanted to ask you um uh, i was reading that they the schools didn't close but they actually like stopped doing like uh outside activities yeah. and this kind no, of stuff. no like recess and stuff i remember yeah, that yeah. like like stopping recess and all this stuff so you as a kid because you said you were like 12 years old and i know you were in connecticut but like how was it like when you watch the news like what what these these people kept saying like so like you couldn't escape it like it was on all the news channels 24 right. 7 they were covering it and and we're going to talk about we're going to see this later in the documentary guys like they were covering it to a, to an extent and actually hurt the investigation because they were so thirsty to cover this thing mm -hmm. that it was round the clock coverage on it like you turn on fox cnn and this was back when cable was a big thing by the way um it was just this and since they were constantly covering it, they needed new information. So, uh, and at the time they had a tip line open and, uh, and any tip that came in that the news thought was like worthy, they would cover that too. So that would send everyone running around in random directions. Like it was, it was crazy. It was a wild, wild time. 
like when I was in school, we didn't have lockdowns, mm -hmm. but it definitely was something where um, they were concerned and they were keeping their finger on the pulse. And if the shooting started going north, they were definitely prepared to close. Wow. Like, like, yeah, because this is an, like from a geographic perspective, you got Washington, D.C. and the DMV down here. Connecticut is over here. So if it started happening in New York or Southern Connecticut, because I was in Central Connecticut at the time, the schools were definitely going to shut down. But did they ever like or or at least like start putting um not shut down. Uh, they will start putting restrictions like, right. hey, no going outside. No like, yeah. yeah OK, so because there are like loads. I, I've been reading, reading that there, there are like loads like school trips that take kids to Washington from around areas. Oh, yeah, they like, cancel. They would cancel any of that for sure. Yeah, yeah. I can imagine. So, yeah, because also these shootings were all like in the morning, like they are yeah. all like <laughs> 7, 41 a.m., yeah. 8 a.m., 9 a.m. That's crazy. Like these are morning killers. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they would just wake up, I guess, have some Kellogg's and, you know, or some Wheaties. They'd be like, Bref breakfast of champions. The next thing you know. That's insane. Yeah. These guys <laughs> that, were on. Some... I, I see why they will close the schools and all this stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Makes sense. Clearly, we are at a level of anxiety with our morning rush hour getting ready to start. Mm. Want to again report a regular, normal opening of school. Yeah, serial killers, if you're not what I'm saying with a C. <laughs> guys, do me a favor. Uh, we got tw almost 20, uh, over 2,500 you guys watching on all platforms. So go ahead and like the video, please. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Uh, if you guys can, come on over to YouTube. I don't foresee that we'll get hit with like some kind of copy bullshit. But um, come on over to YouTube and watch or watch on Twitch and YouTube. Just open up a tab and like the video on YouTube uh, so we can get pushed in the algo. <laughs> we expect a regular school day. I'm never going to win dad of the year. I didn't do that really well. Um, I guess I got all wrapped up in some career thing or something, but between that and divorce. Are you laughing? Somebody said Fresh was the police chief. No, <laughs> just laughing. The chat is just going crazy. Yeah, y'all are me. fucking funny, bro. <laughs> y'all actually pretty funny here. You know, I'm not. Someone put a baby bottle and said, Angie, you dropped this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the dad of the year, but police officers, we're supposed to protect the children. To the WTOP newsroom. There has been a shooting at a school this morning. A child has been shot in front of the Benjamin Castor. A 13-year-old boy had been hit by a single shot to the chest. He was critically in. Eight in the morning. Yo, could you imagine, guys, like you put out uh, an announcement as the police chief saying, we're not closing on the schools. You know, you're safe. Let's go ahead and have a school. And then a kid gets shot the next day. Bruh. That is an L beyond L L's, man. So. That you're going to feel, and you guys are going to see here how the chief reacts to this. He was the sniper's second survivor. Chief Moose was devastated. He was upset over a child being hurt in general, but then over the fact that his words may have been the catalyst that put that child in jeopardy or, or caused that situation to occur was a very heavy, heavy feeling for him. Someone <laughs> is so mean-spirited like that they shot a child. Yeah, he does look a little like fresh. A lighter version, yeah. <laughs> Y'all are hilarious in the chat, man. Now, all of our victims have been innocent, have been defenseless. But now we're stepping over the line because our children don't deserve this. So parents, please do your job tonight. Engage your children. Be there for them. We're going to need it. We're going to need you to support them. But stepping over the line, shooting a kid, I guess it's going to be really, really personal now. So if there's any doubt out there what law enforcement is going to be engaged in, what we're going to be doing, then you can remove all doubt. Now police felt the sniper was not only watching, but possibly reacting to their every word. A child, defenseless, hunt down a child, shoot a child in the back. It just kind of, um, it's very uh, insulting. Um, the whole community just shuddered. 
to see a child shot. Uh, just brought it. Not only see a child shot, but see a child shot after they make the announcement that they're not closing down the schools. These dudes were, were on some demon time. <laughs> Even more anger, more outrage. And yet we couldn't express that because we didn't want to incite whoever was doing this to do even more, to shoot more children. You know, you're starting to be abrasive. It was the longest week in Montgomery County Police Chief Moose's career. A sniper killer had shot eight people, six fatally. The community was paralyzed with fear. All public outdoor events were canceled. The local football and baseball seasons were suspended and all the schools in the area were keeping children locked inside. Heavily armed police and helicopters monitored the local schools. Then at the school where the boy was shot, Moose and his team got their first major break. Police and just so you guys know, when you close down a school, that's a big deal because now... You're closing down a school, which means they can't continue the curriculum. They can't continue the curriculum. That means the kids aren't going to get do the education that they need, right, based on certain parts. Because, as you know, you have to have, you know, schools got to be accredited to a certain degree. They got to teach the kids certain things, which, you know, we can make that debate whether it's indoctrination or not. But this is back in 2002, so it's not as bad as now with this crazy woke world that we're in. But I digress. The point is, is that when you shut down the schools, you significantly limit the county's ability to push the kids through the public education system, which sets everything back. And not only that, it affects commerce, it affects businesses. Everything starts to take a backwards turn, right? Which is why when the pandemic happened with, you know, the beer bug, the <clears throat> if you know what I'm saying, um, Trump was so reluctant to close the country down because he knows the ramifications when you stop businesses, you stop schools, et cetera, okay? And keep in mind, we didn't have the technology and the ability to use Zoom call in, you know, uh, classes online. None of that crap was a thing. Man, we just had America online with that long ass hard dial up, if y'all know what I'm saying. Yo! There was no such thing as Zoom calls or any of that shit back then, man. The internet was still slow as hell. You're using dial up, right, to get onto the fucking thing. You were online, you got mail. <laughs> that was the fastest internet that you had back then in 2002, bro, for all my people that are old enough to remember. So there was none of this crap. So we didn't have the infrastructure back then and the te technology to educate children on a mass scale or, in, or conduct business on a mass scale because the internet wasn't a thing like that back then, guys. So just imagine how much this messed up this community. He uncovered a cryptic piece of evidence. However, they couldn't contain their find. The information was leaked to the hungry press. It could be a critical clue in the sniper shootings. The gunman reportedly has left a message for police tarot card the death card written on it dear policeman i am god channel nine reports the tarot card was found by police the media my man left the tarot card on the scene i'm gonna pull up a picture for it for you guys <laughs> demon time for real report what else was written on the tarot card it said do not release to the press chief was upset because we knew that said not do not release to the press. Press goes ahead and says, Forget about it. And get releases oh it anyway. Fucking hell. To be released to the press. Were there going to be consequences for this by the shooter for having done what he said not to do? Was this in an effort to him to communicate to us? And uh, had we violated that uh, relationship that the shooter Meyer started, uh, tried to start with us? So he was angry with the media for having put it in there and angry with law enforcement for having leaked it to the media. I have not received any message that the citizens of Montgomery County want Channel 9 or the Washington Post or any other media outlet to solve this case. If, if they do, then let me know. We will go and do other police work and we will turn this case over to the media. It was just like everything that we wanted to try was put out for consumption. Here's the infamous tarot card right here, guys. Okay. As you guys can see, um, it says here, call, death, right? And then call me God, written up top with quotes, and then it goes in the back. For you, Mr. Police, uh, code, call me God. Do not release to the press. 
okay? And they were, the press leaked it anyway, which, you know, <laughs> was not course. a good move. But, hey, they were thirsty for views back then. And this thing was all over the news, so they needed content. Remember, guys, they had 24-7 coverage on this thing, so they needed content, unfortunately. So the thirst was definitely real. Yay! And then, obviously, the snipers looked at it like, You triggered my trap card! And kept... <laughs> Get back to it. You know, you're kind of going, well, is it like, does the media want this to continue? As head of the sniper task force, Chief Moose was being pushed to the limit. We're waiting to hear from you. Can you say if you've heard from the person you're communicating with? Anything about the investigation, that kind of detail would be inappropriate. The intense media interest in the case was becoming overwhelming. Uh, sir, the, uh, the, the men and women involved in this... If Chief Moose projects uh, a, a sense to the public that this investigation is out of control or that they they have no real information about what's going on and who's behind it, then with a few more shootings, I think we get to a, a situation where the public will begin to panic. Okay, thank you. I don't think it's too much to say that you could reach a level of pandemonium out here and frustration that um, will will be very hard to contain. With no major leads, only setbacks in the investigation, there were calls for the FBI to take over Moose's case. President Bush agreed that federal support should be available for the sniper manhunt. He sent seasoned FBI investigator, Special Agent Gary Bald, to assist. All right, so now we got that uh, FBI coming in. Now, common misconception that people think from the movies and everything else that I'm going to clear up right now. People think, oh, the FBI is coming in to take over the investigation, blah, blah, blah. Guys, it rarely, if ever, actually operates that way. Typically, when an agency has an investigation, they will stay the lead investigation. And then if the feds do come in, they're either going to assist or if they do take over the investigation, they're going to take it over because the crime that is being committed either is discovered to be or ends up turning into an investigation that that agency that was brought in ends up investigating. For example, let's say it turns out to be a murder investigation at first. Then they find out that they're the individuals that were involved, they're actually committing these murders in furtherance of some type of agenda that leads to terrorism. Well, then at that point, FBI, open up! the FBI is going to come in and get involved because terrorism is their primary uh, investigative area. And it's mandated, by the way, in the government, whether you're state, local, fed, whatever, if there's a terrorism nexus, the FBI must be involved. They are the lead agency in all terrorism cases. Uh, so for me, for example, I'll give you all a, a, a professional experience here with this. I had a national security investigation that involved some individuals, right, that had some connections to uh, an organization that may or may not have been on the, on the watch list. So I had to do my due diligence and bring the FBI involved in, 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 um, into the situation. Thankfully, my co-case agent was on the FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force. So it was very simple. Since he was already, basically, he had two hats. He had an FBI hat and an HSI hat. He was an HSI special agent, but he was assigned to the Joint Terrorism Task Force. I was just able to go through him to do everything that I needed to do. And we basically did our notifications that way, right? Which is the importance of having task force officers. So, um, but anything that's national security related or terrorism related, the FBI is going to be involved. And remember, guys, this is 2002. This is peak, you know, uh, you know, U.S. fear of terrorism because 9-11 had just happened. We had the anthrax attacks. We're prepping to invade Iraq at this point. There was a war on terror going on back then. This is almost this is over 20 years ago, but I remember this vividly. So obviously the FBI is going to be involved. And then also keep in mind that there was enormous press coverage on this. So they're like, yo, we need to get this thing solved. Let's get federal resources in. And the FBI is the most well-funded federal law enforcement agency in the United States. This is prior to um, Homeland Security being created. So they're going to jump in and give some aid. And then also, you know, in the back of every mind, everyone's minds at this point, they're thinking, is this a terrorism investigation? So they're looking at it like, bring the FBI in. And if it does end up being terrorism, they could come in and assist and take over from that point. But keep in mind, this is still going to be a Montgomery County-led investigation, guys. Because at this point, all we got is a bunch of shootings, which murder nine out of ten times, guys, is always going to be a state investigation, unless they're able to tie it to some other crime. This must have been on, t on TV all the time. All the time, Non-stop. man. You couldn't escape it. You couldn't escape it. Yeah. I remember they would stop TV shows sometimes to cover to give coverage on this. It was an interesting uh, 
situation for me because I'd never met Chief Moose before. And I was very sensitive to the fact. So now the Bureau's involved. So you had the ATF and Montgomery involved in the beginning because there was a firearm involved. And then obviously the state and local police take over murder investigations. But now you got the Bureau coming in, which at this point, they're not the lead agency. That he would think I was coming in to take the investigation over. President Bush backed Chief Moose and confirmed he would continue to lead the sniper case. And that's a common misconception. A lot of times people think that the feds come in and they just take over the investigations. That's not how it goes, guys. That's rarely, if ever, how it goes. The feds, a lot of times, come in and assist. And um, nine out of 10 times, there's really good working relations between the state, local, and fed partners. Um, it's not like the movies, guys. That's a very, very common uh, stereotype, but it's not true. Special Agent Bald called up the Rapid Response Unit. They arrived with a blank check and within 24 hours set up a fully operational sniper command center. And that's one of the beauties of having the feds involved. You can go ahead and set up, you get the extra funding and the help, and they had a command center set up in 24 hours. Now, guys, you're probably wondering, what the fuck is a command center? A command center, guys, anytime you got a national crisis going on like that, whether it's a terrorism attack, whether it's a mass shooter, etc., and you need to be able to get this case solved in a quick amount of time and you don't have leads, you get you establish something called a command center, right? I remember, I'll never forget this, when the um, Boston Marathon bombing happened, the FBI set up a command center at their um, at Federal Plaza over there um, uh, in downtown Boston at their headquarters. And what ends up happening is all the leads that come in, they get all the phone calls come into one place, all the leads come in, and they disperse the leads to different investigators from different agencies that are involved in the situation. And they're able to have a command post where all the, you know, all the brass, all the leadership, the case agents, et cetera, are all in one location working together, fielding the calls, uh, getting the leads, and um, working the investigation together so they have one unified path towards getting the case solved. And a command post helps for that significantly. Any type of big case like that, whether if you guys watch my 9-11 breakdown, they ended up turning a parking garage into a command post. If you watch my uh, Boston Marathon bombing, they ended up having... Uh, a command post and obviously a mass shooter situation like this where they don't have the individual identified step number one create a command post so that everyone can be under one roof one house getting all the leads and working together to have a unified front against finding these guys because especially when you're getting the the public involved and getting calls you need to be able to field those calls and give out leads and divvy them out to other investigators to follow them down um yeah go ahead yeah uh, well i just want to say yeah you guys are, are right like i don't know what an anthrax is Oh, anthrax? Oh, yeah. so my bad. That's a good, qu good question. Sometimes, and got, I'm glad that Angie asked these questions because I, I, you know, I'm working at a thousand miles per hour and some of you guys might not know some of the jargon I use. If you, uh, so, for some of you younger people, anthrax was like, <laughs> basically this like powder that was being pushed through the mail and mailed to people. And if you like inhale it, it was basically like deadly and it would get people killed. And when they the have? anthrax attack began, it happened right after 9-11. And um, what ended up happening, they were saying like death to Israel, Death to America. Um, so it's like a venom? It's like a, yeah, it's, it's basically like poison, like a, a very toxic powder substance. And if oh, you inhale yeah. it, it can be deadly. And they were mailing it out randomly post 9-11. And I'm going to get into way more detail on this, by the way, with Ryan Dawson, because anthrax is actually a critical component um, when it comes to 9-11 and, you know, how um, them boys were involved, okay? False flags, all that other stuff. But... Um, but that's basically what it is if I'm going to go give it a nutshell. Uh, it's basically a deadly powder slash substance that if you inhale, you pretty much is fatal. Wow. Yeah. And this was on the heels right after 9-11. And when it was first distributed, it was like, death to America, death to Israel, uh, praise Allah, which obviously made it look like it was Islamic terrorist. But we'll go into more detail about that when we cover 9-11. Them boys doing some things. There is a unit. Uh, in uh, the FBI that is responsible for rapidly deploying and setting up a command post structure uh, to support field operations. It was much easier to bring those resources from another part of the FBI that has it basically in a box and they show up and set it up. It really comes together very quickly. So this is real life footage from the actual command post, guys. They got it distorted so you can't see the agents' faces. But uh, yeah, and that's why I like this documentary because you guys are kind of seeing it firsthand from the law enforcement perspective. Yeah. And you know, like the video, by the way, guys, uh, we got 1.2K likes, um, like the video. So it gets up in the, in, the, uh, in the feed for people and more people can figure out, you know, the history of the DC snipers. There are uh, a 
number of other resources that the FBI brings to bear in a situation like that, including behavioral scientists, which would uh, help me in understanding the type of criminal that we're dealing with, you may be familiar with it through Silence of the Lambs. The scientists provide a profile uh, of uh, the people likely to be responsible for the killings. Uh, they'll base that on prior um, uh, shooting incidents, prior serial killers. In the newly established Joint Operations Center, over 400 local and federal police work round the clock. The Sniper Reward Fund, set up on the first day, had reached $237,000. Holy! Big money to find them boys. Well, not them boys, but you, the snipers, I mean. <laughs> it doubled in one day after the child was shot. Police were swamped with calls to their hotline over 2,000 a day. Despite the high number, there were few good leads. Tension mounted. And just so you guys know, $230,000 back in 2002 is equivalent in purchasing power to about $385,000 today. So, uh, yeah, it's quite a bit of money. The community waited helplessly for another killing. Good distance away from that uh, Sonoco station, they're keeping us back, but uh, there's an FBI helicopter, untold FBI helicopter up above me, surveying the scene. We're told that one man is dead. He was at the pumps at the gas station, shot dead at the scene. Uh, no apparent sign of uh, an assailant. Two days after the boy was shot, the sniper claimed his ninth victim. 53-year-old Dean Myers was killed by a single shot to the chest. Following that murder, Chief Moose and the investigators detected a change in the sniper's pattern. The killer seemed to be selecting targets that were close to highways, offering quick escape routes. Two days later, in Fredericksburg, Virginia, the killer made his most brazen move to date, with a police officer standing just 50 yards away. Wow, here we go. Kenneth Bridges was shot and killed. That just tells you how brazen these guys were. Right with the police right there, still shooting people. And you guys are going to see how they're able to get away with this for so long and not be caught. Eyewitnesses gave the police a promising new lead. Right after the shooting in Fredericksburg, there comes uh, 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 two witnesses, actually, who see what's described as a white van and they believe is somehow um, related to the shooting. Each said they saw a white van with a ladder rack on top. It was Chief Moose's best lead to date. But motor vehicle records showed over 100,000 white vans registered in the Washington, D.C. area alone. It had the unfortunate impact of having the media uh, conclude that the um, people responsible for the shootings were operating those vehicles. And, and despite uh, Chief Moose's repeated reminders, uh, it, it, the media didn't want to take no for an answer on that. And so it constantly was played as these are the vehicles that were uh, being used by the snipers, <clears throat> I think. And this is how the media being over-involved can hurt an investigation. The impact of that was that when shooting scenes occurred after that, people looked up and the first white van they saw or the first box truck they saw um, consumed their attention, and they may not have seen other vehicles that were in the area. Speaking of vans, just so you guys understand here, back in 1993 when we had the original World Trade Center bombing, what was it? A van involved. When we had 9-11, there was also suspects caught in vans, which, all I'm going to say, them boys, vans, and explosives. That's all I'm going to say. You need to, guys, May fucking 5th, to, uh, May 5th, next week, we are going to go into this in detail. With Ryan Dawson. I, I don't want to, with Ryan Dawson, I don't want to divulge too much, but I, just to get, let you guys be aware, there was a lot of paranoia when it comes to white white vans in the United States at that period of time because vans were synonymous with terrorist attacks back then. Okay, guys? Whether it was the 1993 World Trade Center bombing or the 9-11, uh, 
right? There were definitely people in vans to include them boys back in 9-11. And we're going to talk about this in detail. Also, McVeigh as well. All right, guys. So go ahead and make sure May 5th, next week, we're going to cover, cover in details. But yes. So you can only imagine the 2002 talking about vans. The media had everyone on edge, man. Paranoia was rampant. A second weekend passed without a shooting. The press speculated that the sniper was a family man only able to kill during the week. Local people were terrified. Washington was a city under siege. Community leaders advised people to avoid wooded areas and use covered parking when shopping. In the covered car park of a DIY store, a woman and her husband were loading packages into their car. Linda Franklin was then shot, the sniper's 11th victim. That was the FBI analyst that we talked about earlier. Rest in peace to her. She died at the scene. Anonymous complaint of a white Chevy Astro van occupied by a white male. After that killing, the sniper went eerily quiet. Five tense days passed without another shooting. The police were besieged with calls from the public. Most offered information, but there were also crank callers who claimed to be the sniper. After nearly a week of silence, the killer decided to contact the police. Good morning. Don't say anything. Just listen. Where are the people that are causing the killing in your area? Oh, the police are getting getting their clue. Look on the terror card. It says. Call me God. Do not release the press. We have called you three times before, trying to set up negotiations. We've got no response. People have died. And the reason why, guys, they weren't able to respond is because keep in mind, they were they got a hundred thousand leads during the course of this case. Two thousand leads a day. Okay? So a lot of them were falling through the cracks. The police operator didn't realize the significance of the call. Sir, I need to report you to that Montgomery County Police Hotline. We're not investigating the crime. Would you like the number? Control. The killer hung up. L. Dispatcher. <laughs> Saturday, October 19th. On Saturday morning, Washington again buried its dead. Vietnam veteran Dean Myers was laid to rest. Saturday night approached. Why is that every time we get dispatchers on FedEx, they're fucking retarded and end up yeah. getting people get killed, bro? Yo. <laughs> I was about to say that. Like, yo, we're always getting dispatchers doing dumb shit on this channel, bro. Yeah. Bum They're always so negligent. It seems like it was going to be a third quiet. And it's always female dispatchers, too. <laughs> Guys, yeah. this is why oh women deserve God. less. Book in stores, <laughs> ninjas. Okay? They clearly can't do their goddamn jobs. Get the book, Why Women Deserve Less, Amazon bestseller. Go ahead. I had to get a, a quick plug in there. <laughs> Don't forget to like the goddamn video. Let's keep going with the so documentary. It's Spanish. Yeah. Guys. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Spanish version coming very soon. Shout out to Angie. She's translating it right now as we speak. Uh, when do you think we'll be able to get that thing released? Uh, probably June uh, or mid-June. Mid-June? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, Angie. We were supposed to get it May, May 1st. Well, again, no. this is why women deserve less. June Book 1st. Book stores. Even Angie. Deserve less. You're crazy. You said June 1st. <laughs> I'll just fuck with you. <laughs> All right, guys, yeah, book is going to come out in Spanish as well, man. Shout out to Angie for helping me with that. She's going to translate it for you guys. Um, she's making sure that she has uh, the Spanish on point. She's translating some of my terms, yeah. etc. Yeah, it's kind of difficult Spanish. because Myron's it's got a lot of slang. <laughs> so book is source come in English, Amazon bestseller. Get it now, and it's going to be out in Spanish probably hopefully within a month or so. Weekend for Moose and his team. But then, breaking news. shooting in 
Ashland, Virginia, this breaking story, not known yet whether this is connected to the sniper investigation. There are also reports that police are looking for a white econoline van with a ladder rack. Don't you For the first time, the sniper had attacked on a weekend. In the small town of Ashland, Virginia, 80 miles south of Washington, D.C., the killer had shot his 12th victim. Now that is military. Yeah, that's, that that's military message. right there. They were getting back into the car. He was shot in the, in the stomach. Uh, he's apparently going to make it. He's in uh, stable but serious condition, still in surgery. Uh, they think it may have been from the woods. Okay, thanks, sir. We'll do that. Has the determination been made whether this is the sniper that's been in the Washington, D.C. metro area, or is it not? Guys. 2700 plus you guys watching 2800 if we include the uh, twitch ninjas guys like the video we should be at 2000 likes easy i only see 1.4k likes guys like the video subscribe to the channel if you haven't already share this video with a friend that likes true crime all right you guys are not going to get insight and details broken down to this level anywhere else on the internet because to my knowledge actually i've never seen another youtuber that was former uh federal agent that actually did case of this a lot of these people that you know, used to be feds or whatever. They've never done actual investigations. I've testified hundreds of times. I've written hundreds of criminal complaints. I've written hundreds of search warrants. I know what the fuck I'm talking about when it comes to this stuff. When it comes to being arrogant about one thing, this field, this this, uh, this discipline, <laughs> this is one thing I am arrogant about because I actually was out here doing these types of cases, man. So like the video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and uh, let's get to 2,000 likes, all right? No, there is no evidence right now to conclude that. Everyone is a potential witness that was here at the time. So we're going through and not putting blinders and interviewing as many people as possible. Is there anything on the white van that was stopped in Stafford County at about 11 tonight? That was a state police stopped that van, I believe, in Stafford County. I do not have any further information from that. The biggest thing we're waiting for right now is daylight. What's the status on 95? The sniper expressed his contempt for Chief Moose and his investigators. Behind the Ponderosa, police found a letter pinned to a tree. Handwritten in a childish scrawl, the sniper again boasted, I am God. All right, so now, again, you know, taking a page out of the Zodiac Killer and the BTK Killer, he's writing taunting notes to the police. I, I, anytime you do this, guys, not only are you going to get the police more inclined to catch you, but it's going to create a media spectacle. So this thing was all over the place, man. He blamed five of the last shootings on police. The price paid for not responding to his phone calls. Zero accountability from the freaking killers. Bomb I'm committing these crimes because you're not listening to my phone calls. He's saying <laughs> that he's actually reached out several times and he's been not been able to communicate with the police the way he'd hoped or the way he wanted, basically referring to the police as incompetent. In the letter, he had demanded $10 million. He also told police he would contact them at 6 a.m. Sunday morning on a telephone number in Virginia. Unfortunately, the letter could not be opened until forensics were completed. By then, the sniper's deadline had passed. Al Forensics. Also, keep in mind, guys, they didn't have the capacity and the technology to do a uh, quick turnaround forensic analysis like they do now. It's 2002, man. Like, bro, people barely even had cell phones. The letter was opened after that time, so that opportunity was missed. To the person who left us a message at the Ponderosa last night, 
you gave us a telephone number. We do want to talk to you. Call us at the number you provide. Following the Saturday shooting, the killer again telephoned the police. The call is traced to a payphone in Virginia. The authorities staked out the area and surrounded a white van. The media reported it all live on national television. Mayor Doug Duncan once, ahead, once again getting in the middle of the investigation. Waited to hear if Chief Moose had caught the killer. Yeah, yeah, I, I, we got all that. We just we just haven't confirmed. Look at this guy with his phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, look, look at bro, the phone. <laughs> those are the phones that they had back then. <laughs> What are the names of these phones? What, what's the name of these phones? I don't even know what that is. That's like a piece <laughs> of crap, a fucking, uh, maybe, uh, what were the phones back then? The flip phones. They, they used to call, it was like singular back then. They didn't even call it at I think it was called singular back then, man. Some of y'all old enough, that? you guys know what I'm talking about, man. A sprint flip, maybe, yeah, sprint maybe. Yo, L phone right there, man. The Motorola. We were at headquarters. Yeah, Motorola. Motorola. They had the Nokias back in the day. Uh, until a few minutes ago, then uh, Doug went to see the chief. Said, you know, and didn't you have Moose has called a press conference for any? Someone said that was a razor. Definitely not a razor, bro. That it, was my. First I remember phone. razors used to be like the cool phones back then. But man, this is bring it back. Memories, I remember bro. that was my first phone. Yeah, that flip phone, Motorola. <laughs> he stormed the white van. There were two men inside. They were illegal immigrants, with no connection to the sniper shootings. He sees this. Womp womp. <laughs> Catch two Mexicans. Gay! Okay, what the hell's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> Over here getting caught thinking that they're the snipers. This is just going to really piss him off. The this is really going to tell him that, number one, we, you know, we messed up as the police. Number two, we didn't follow orders. We're not doing what we're supposed to do. You know, it, it, and all these thoughts about what could be going through his head at this time, if he's seeing what we're seeing, and uh, we were pretty sure that he probably was, um, and how he would react. At dawn, on Tuesday, October 22nd, after 18 days of shootings away from Montgomery County, the sniper came back. A local bus driver was preparing. Everyone was involved, guys. You see how many agencies? You got Secret Service, ATF, FBI, local police. Everyone and their mom was involved in this investigation, man. Guys, also, I'm looking. 1.5K likes. We need 2,000. Get us to 2,000 likes, goddammit. For his morning route when he was shot in the doorway of his vehicle uh we're just waiting to hear from the hospital um and he died okay following two hours of surgery Conrad Johnson, the killer's 13th victim, had died. The killer had returned to taunt Moose and his investigators on their home turf. It was, uh, in, in some respects, uh, uh, reassuring when that shooting took place back in that, the area that we were really saturating. Uh, with investigative resources so um, certainly not reassuring by any means from the standpoint of a loss of life but uh, that particular scene to me was somebody who was familiar with that territory i, I uh, spent a lot of time at that scene and it's it's off the beaten path it's not by major interstates so uh, that's that scene kind of talked to me more than other scenes did at the bus scene police found another letter from the sniper it mocked their inability to catch him. That's now he's messing with them. He's leaving letters taunting them, telling them that they're incompetent, that they're, you know, stupid. Same afternoon, rumors were spreading that the killer had told police he planned to target children again. The media tell Chief Moose they're going to run with this story. The chief had a tough decision to make. Keep the contents of the letter secure and obey the killer's instruction not to release to the press or reveal its true threat to prevent a press-induced public hysteria. Bro, holy! 
That is a tough decision to make. You're between a rock and a hard place. Your children are not safe anywhere at any time. We feel it's important to provide this information to the public. I remember standing there with him and he just was, that was the hardest thing I had to do. It was a devastating thing to have to do and it, and it left us it left us feeling terrible hey sweetie did you hear what he said at the end of the press conference they read a statement and the chief said that the guy said p.s no, p.s your children are not safe anywhere at any time Just keep them in, keep them in the backyard. Don't let them ride their bikes or anything. I mean, we'll send them to school, but I'll take them to school. That's the kind of stuff that really pisses you off as a parent. I want to know that stuff when it happens. I don't want to be told about it three days later. And they still don't have a damn shred of information that he hasn't provided them. Not one witness. The hunt for the Washington sniper was now the biggest story in the world. For three weeks, the killer had evaded capture by Chief Moose's thousand-strong sniper investigation force. The 1,400 journalists monitoring the case outnumbered the police, and they're in 1,400 journalists, thousand law enforcement officers working on this investigation. Guys, wild, 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 wild. If you were alive at this time, you guys already know how ridiculous this was back then. Tense scrutiny was absurd. Sometimes I'd be wondering, like imagine if a case like this happened in today's day and age with the social media, it would be everywhere. TikTok, Snapchat, YouTube, it would be everywhere, man. Some of these investigations, the DC sniper case, OJ Simpson, um, even the Boston Marathon bombing, it was big back then, but it would have been even bigger if social media had the same prevalence that it does today. Like guys, Unprecedented news coverage. Yeah, most 9 11, if that happened in the social media age, craziness, man. Mo most of this news in America become international pretty quickly. Yep, absolutely. Like, we hear about them in Venezuela, so. Constructing the investigation. A portion of the developments in the case that we need to really focus on right now, and we are not going to be holding a press conference. If there are developments that occur in the next few hours or overnight that we can call you together. Guys, we're only at 1.6K likes, man. We need another 400 to hit 1,000, 2,000. There's 2,700 of y'all watching right now on YouTube alone. Uh, and then another 100 plus y'all. We're almost at 3K all together between YouTube and Twitch. If you're watching on Twitch, open up a tab on YouTube. Go ahead and hit that smash button. Smash that like button. That's the only thing I ask, guys. Hit the like button. Stop being fucking ninja watchers there. Sitting in silence with a mask on like a weirdo. Like the video. That's the only thing I asked. You don't got to donate a dollar to the stream. Just like the video. Together again for and give you the information or ask for your assistance. We will. You, but thank you. You talked Why about were they intentionally going to have a press conference before? But she said, unfortunately, we've had a development in the case. So I'm not quite sure what that means. Who knows? He could have called. He could have not called. They got a tip. Nobody knows. There's been something that's happened just now. Something took them off. They're supposed to have this okay. briefing. Now they say we've got developments that have caused us to go down different avenues with the investigation. Hey, Don, Dennis here. All right, guys, just so you know, give, give you guys a little uh, thing here. And this is especially from the law enforcement perspective. Typically, when law enforcement does a press conference, they do it to give information to the public so that it can kind of relieve stress and kind of familiarize them with what's going on, going on without giving them too much information to hurt the investigation. Anytime they have a press conference, and they cancel it. The media knows right then and there. They just got into the development. They don't want to alert what's going on. Let's go ahead and dig and try to figure out what they just got. Did they get a search warrant? Did they get someone in custody? It makes the media go crazy anytime they have a press conference scheduled and they end up not doing it. This will end up happening with the Boston Marathon bombers. They had a press conference um, uh, scheduled, but then they got the pictures and identified who these guys were. At the time, they didn't know what their names were, but they had pictures of them dropping the backpacks by the finish line. 
So that made the media speculate as to what was going on. And they ended up getting a leak of the pictures of the individuals involved. And what ended up happening was they went ahead and wanted to leak the picture. So that put the FBI and the Boston Police Department commissioner and the AUSA in a very tough position. And they had to this, they had to do a press conference uh, and release the photos and say, hey, we need help identifying them because the news is going to do it first. So that's a quick little uh, tidbit there that most people don't know. But yes, anytime there's a media um, coverage event scheduled and it gets canceled by the police, the media knows right then and there, they got some new information. They're following up on it. Let's go ahead and pry and see what they're doing. Listen, who do you know has been talking about this? I got, I got a, uh, I'd like the video. You ain't going to get sauce like that nowhere else. God damn it. <laughs> Smash that like button. 2000 likes are bust. Last, there was a major pause breakthrough. In communications, the killer bragged he was responsible for a September shooting in Alabama. It was his first mistake. Oh, here we go. This is the beginning. So he goes ahead and brags that he was responsible for a shooting in Alabama. Mobile, to be exact, if I'm not mistaken, the mobile area. A fingerprint was taken from the scene and put through the federal database. It gave police a name. Bam. And just so you guys know real quick, going back to the, web, the FBI website, right? So... The investigators soon learned that a crime similar to the one described in the call had indeed taken place and that a fingerprint and ballistic evidence were available from the case. An agent from our mobile uh, office gathered that evidence and quickly flew to Washington, D.C., arriving on Monday, uh, Monday evening, October 21st, while ATF handled the, handled the ballistic evidence. We took, the important, uh, we took the fingerprint evidence to the FBI laboratory. So the agent from mobile literally hand-delivered it to make sure that it would get done immediately, okay? And the following morning, our fingerprint database produced a match. A magazine dropped at the crime scene bore the fingerprint of Lee Boyd Malvo from a previous arrest in Washington State. Okay, and, uh, and it was this guy, the younger guy. Okay, this dude. This he was idiot. 17. He was 17 at the time. So that was the first fuck up. Damn. But let's see what ended up happening, guys, in Washington, D.C. Uh, excuse me, in Washington State. Well, Mobile, Alabama, and the connection to Washington. We identified uh, a person that we felt may have played a role in that crime in Alabama uh, that led us out to uh, Tacoma, Washington. And you guys are going to see how the press once again sticks their nose into the situation and hurts the investigation. And it led us to some interviews there that um, prompted a search of a residence. In a garden 3,000 miles from Montgomery County, the ATF removed a bullet-ridden tree stump. The police now had their strongest lead to date. Unfortunately, the media was jeopardizing Moose's investigation, broadcasting live images of the search. Look at that. Breaking news. Seattle FBI, live news of them doing the search. So could you imagine, like, they're doing the search right then and there, but they probably got a search warrant. And you got the press covering it real time, bro. Talk about a pain in the ass of the investigation, man. Yay! Back to try to search for small metal objects. Quite obviously, it could be either brass shell casings or lead slugs, which police could then try to match with the brass and the lead that they've got from back here from the D.C. area sniper shootings and killing. The entire situation that happened in Tacoma, Washington, with a tree stump, was supposed to be something as simple as just going quietly to recover a tree stump. And it, it turned into what I, I would term a media circus. And if the sniper had been watching television that night, could have been gone. My understanding is this house is some place that, the, that this guy may have lived in the past. That's my understanding. And that's, I think he may have lived there. That he, yeah. Somehow they were getting the information before we were getting the information. Um, it was unfolding in Washington. They were doing their own investigative reporting. It was coming out before we even had it. We're getting a license plate. So you got them, like, because guys, keep in mind, they're doing this investigation over in Tacoma, Washington, doing the searches, and the press is getting the information before the lead agency, Montgomery uh, Sheriff's Office, is getting the information. That tells you guys how bad the media leaks were, man. Yeah. Really getting in the way of the investigation. And before we continue, let me go ahead. We'll do a quick little super chat break here um, because they're piling up. 
Dave Chico yeah. goes, I was watching the Boston Marathon at site of the bombing. At 2.18 p.m., I received a text from a running club teammate to meet up at the mile 23 mark. That text message saved my life. Wow. <laughs> Crazy, bro. Shout out to you, my friend. Glad you're here with us to tell the story. I was born in Montgomery County where this happened. I was six at the time, and I remember my father moving us to Joint Andrews base to avoid outdoors. Yeah, man, it was a wild time. Keon goes, love the show. I'm from Guam. Currently a truck driver and looking to buy my own truck and get into real estate as well as going to go back to college. What degree would you recommend that'll help? Get a degree, guys. I'm a proponent of college if it's going to get you a job. So whether it's something in STEM, uh, right, or uh, maybe something in medicine that's going to get you a job, make sure you get a degree that will get you a job. That's my only thing. All right. Or you could go into a trade as well. Uh, Angie, I might need your help with this. What is that? <laughs> um, this is bad Spanish, but it says basically that these guys look like your cousins. Oh, fantastic. I appreciate that, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Akbar! Okay. Uh, we got here. Uh, free 03 uh, Garrido goes, can you do uh, the Draco, the Ruler story? TLR has a documentary. Yes, I can. I'll also do a King Von one as well from, uh, he's talking about. That's you. Yeah, he's talking about our, our boy Trapler Ross. Uh, Breland Jefferson, y'all go, go and do James Holmes, Case Dark Knight. Mm, if we get time. Uh, Jeremy goes, thank you for bringing us fire content. Have you thought about doing a firearms training video or stream? Maybe do it at a gun range? I have thought about that, actually. That wouldn't be a bad idea. Teach you guys how to shoot a gun properly. I want to go to to shooting range. Uh, you can't shoot because you're uh, a foreign national. A uh, what? I'm just kidding. <laughs> but we'll, 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 uh, we'll plan something out for you guys. Don't worry. Uh, frankly goes, I used to live very close to some of the shootings. I remember parents were scared to let children go to school. My family in Nigeria even called to make sure we were all right. Yeah, man, that was crazy time, bro. National coverage. This is uh, international coverage. This is going to help with my criminology career. I actually take notes on these live streams. Okay. Wait, hey, bro, Don that's what's up, man. Don't Marco for that one. I'm glad that I'm giving y'all a lot of insight. Uh, Brian Inf, uh, Inf Edge goes, good old Feta to keep, uh, to help cope the L Knicks took. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. That, that was the, big today. The Knicks suck. Uh, was... This. <laughs> Them boys goes, them boys are crazier than us boys. Okay, I appreciate that, them boys. <laughs> <laughs> Martin, when are you going to do the Waco takes a shootout with David Koresh? That was huge. FBI and ATF was involved. Yes, it was. Yes. We will cover that as well. I'll probably do it after the Mafia. Um, speaking of which, I also, after the Mafia, I got planned. We're going to do Dave Koresh but, and the Waco siege. Knew. We're going to do the Golden State Killer. Um, oh, and yeah. What else? Uh, probably other, a couple other serial killers as well. The uh, torso Edmund killer. Kemper. Ed Kemper, yes. Yep. And who's the Canadian one that they've been asking for? Robert Picton. There we go. We'll cover that as well for y'all. And Aaron Hernandez. But that's all going to come after the mafia, guys. Uh, Mar, I love the podcast. This is from Raj Flower. Do you guys broadcast after our show in 1080p or 4K? Because my settings on my computer say 1080k. I have a 4K computer. We shoot it at 1080, at 1080 guys. Uh, did someone say food and that eat then decline? You guys are fucking hilarious, bro. <laughs> Uh, Colin Parker goes, like the damn video, Myron, appreciate the work on breaking down these cases. Also, it's nice to see you on a channel where your hair follicles aren't falling out. Yes, I appreciate that, guys. And the hair is coming back. They're, the gains are coming back slowly. back because of Fetty, you guys. Yeah, it grows back because of Fetty. <laughs> um, speaking of which, but it isn't going to grow on back because you guys don't like the video fast enough. We got 1.8K likes to my knowledge right now, right? Let me refresh the page. We should be at 2,000, guys, easy, all right? Uh, what do I, yeah, 1.8K, guys. Yo, 200 more likes, let's get this thing to 2,000, all right? Uh, then we got here, Brian and Fletch. Who would have thought that Fresh is a time traveler? Yep, Fresh apparently was the sheriff of Montgomery County. By the way, Mark, Mark, call it Audi Arabia. Yeah, Audi Arabia. Okay, that rhymes. With, yeah, all right, Audi Arabia. Uh, Angie is wise for an adult teenager female. <laughs> Don't let her looks fool you guys. She's 26. She old. Uh, I'm 25. Uh, or 25? Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, well, she's still old. Uh, if, if I was a Leonardo DiCaprio, I'd be breaking up with her right about now. Uh, Martin, <laughs> <laughs> Martin, you should cover the shooting that happened yesterday in Texas five dead shooter. They're still being looked for. Uh, okay. I could, uh, write that. Can you write that down real quick, Angie? Cause that's yeah. actually, What's uh, the name of it? uh, we, they don't know. They said apparently five people killed in Texas. Um, oh yeah. I read about that. Uh, Martin, have you done uh, the cult killings in uh, done in Matamoros? They killed UT student Mark Kilroy. They were a uh, cartel led by Sarah L. Durete and Adolfo Constanzo. That has not come up. We haven't done that one. Brian Fledge, where's Officer Fresh to save the day? Uh, he ain't in this one. Remember, the white van's also the vehicle of choice for pedos. Fair enough. Who deserve less than women? Them boys deserve less. Uh, shout out to Zena in the house uh, showing her classic of love for them boys. Uh, kill a can. 
On a previous Fed episode, you mentioned a documentary for us to watch on Rumble to prepare for your stream of Ryan Dawson. What was it? Numec, my friends. N-U-M-E-C. Okay. Numec, N-U-M-E-C. Okay. If you guys. You said, was it like dancing with the Yuri? Yeah. Uh, that 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 doesn't incorporate them, but it does talk about them boys and how they're involved in JFK and stealing some uh, nuclear secrets. Zeno the Witch goes, Nokia the flip phone, I know phones. Wink, wink. We know that one because you're a former scammer. Shout out to Zena. <laughs> uh, FBI, open up. Hit my drop. FBI, open up. I appreciate that, FBI. We got you. FBI, open up! And then we got Homeland Security Investigations in the house. W. Myron, you know we, how we get stuff done? Chris is a bum. Shout out to y'all. <laughs> my former agency in the house. Appreciate y'all are watching. Uh, media, most effective devil in America. I like that one, IRS. Uh, and then we got uh, Blink Dark Mellow. Like this video, everyone. Let's get it past 2K. Love you, Myra Gaines. You are my hero. Thank you for, thank you so much for the content you provide us with. I got y'all, man. Trying to give you guys that edutainment. Well, we got almost 2,900 you guys watching all together, man, uh, on YouTube and on Twitch. You said entertainment. What was that? You said Andrew Tatum. No, 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 edutainment. Oh edutainment. Okay. <laughs> Carlos like Maserat, uh, super sticker, 20 bucks. I appreciate that. Uh, Crypto Slim goes, can you do a video on the Booby Boys and John Doe from Miami? Never heard of that. Oh, speaking of which, by the way, real quick, guys, the crypto course is still open. Get in there, guys. Um, I think they're going to close it either tonight or tomorrow, um, but they're going to start here very soon, man. Guys, I got a six-figure portfolio on cryptocurrency. Thanks to them. Uh, so go ahead and get in there. I'll drop a link for it as well in the chat for y'all. Um, Umar Yassin goes, Assalamu alaikum, bro. Uh, thanks for the work you do. I can't entirely agree with some of your outlook on dating, which I'll ask during the FNF show. On a side note, how can we sponsor the FNF show? Uh, I mean, yo, just like the video, man. Subscribe, man. Uh, we're, you know, like I said, Super if you guys chat, donate, man. that's great. Yeah. But you guys don't have to donate a dollar to any of these streams, man. I genuinely just appreciate that you guys are watching, supporting, sharing it with a friend and uh, helping the channel grow. You know, I value that immensely and i value your guys support immensely so don't forget to like the video subscribe to all the channels whether it's uh fresh and fit fresh and fit clips more fresh and fit clips uh freshman ceo uh fed at 1811 those are channels that we run so i appreciate you guys showing love and rocking with us um all right let's get back to the documentary guys uh i see that we're only at 1.9k likes again we should easily be at 2000 plus so like the video man let's get back on a uh, on a vehicle and uh are you hearing about it, new jersey without waiting for police confirmation the press named the sniper suspects well, mike and jane this is fast breaking but we can put up on the screen and you know shout out to all the mods in the chat by the way um you know whether it's the irs homeland security investigations or fbi all you guys got mod uh, wrenches now um xena in the house all you guys that are helping out with modding the chat and everything else like that. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate that. You guys help the show run nice and efficiently. Um, and on this channel, guys, we don't really uh, restrict y'all as much because, you know, it's it's funny, the shit that y'all post in here. So, um, <laughs> you know, just try to keep, try, try to not, you know, violate the hate speech guidelines. But other than that, man, love the chat. Love you guys. It's always entertaining to read the chat. Y'all be having Angie dying in the back a lot of the time. Yeah. So you guys see her laughing. Nine out of ten times, it's what you guys say in the chat. <laughs> so um shout out to y'all like the video uh support the channel and shout out to the chat and the mods tonight the names of the two men not one but two men they want as quote persons of interest in the sniper yeah john allen williams lee melvin john allen allen williams is yo that is crazy the media knew who these guys were before the police <laughs> Malvo. They are both black males, one about 40 years of age, the other one said to be about 20 years of age. In addition, there's now a firm vehicle alert. No box truck, no Chevy Astro, no white vehicle at all. Instead, a dark 1990 Chevrolet Caprice car. NDA21Z, Nancy David Alpha 21Z. Police are asking anybody who sees that vehicle to call 911 immediately. Vic, Denise. Authorities want to make sure that they've got all of their... Y'all are hilarious, bro. Mario, we need you back. Homeland Security Investigations. <laughs> then FBI goes, we took an L there. <laughs> <laughs> FBI, open up! <laughs> <laughs> Yo, you guys are fucking hilarious, man. W mods in the chat, man. Wow. Eyes dotted and their T's crossed before they step in front of that podium because, because they are very well aware that their audience is not just the public, 
but also the person or persons believed to be responsible for the string of killings that have left 10 people dead and three others wounded dating back to October 2nd. Police confirmation of the names came one hour after. You know what? It'll be hilarious if you which by the way, like the video. Yo, it'll be hilarious if you guys like made uh, names for like ATF, uh, fucking <laughs> um, Secret Service. Obviously, we got IRS, <laughs> FBI, and HSI already. Um, but it would be CIA. hilarious if y'all started making like uh, law enforcement law agencies person, yeah. and uh, commented on this shit. It would just be fucking funny. So uh, go ahead if anybody wants to do it. I'll mod you up. Uh, just don't, just make sure that you actually, you know, you're not a pain in the ass as a mod. The media had released them. A federal arrest warrant has been issued. Yeah, DEA, etc. For John <laughs> Allen Muhammad, also known as John Allen Williams. He should be considered armed and dangerous. He may be in the company of a juvenile. The police released an image of one of the men they were looking for. Which, by the way, just so you guys know, they ended up issuing an arrest warrant for uh, Muhammad, right? So what happened was they... Um, uh, so when they work with ATF, right, and they revealed that Muhammad had a Bushmaster 223 rifle in his possession, a federal violation since he had been served with a restraining order to stay away from his ex-wife. That enabled us to charge him with federal weapons violations and with Malvo clearly connected, the FBI and ATF jointly obtained a federal material witness warrant for him. The legal papers were now in our hands. So just so you guys know, so keep in mind, they identified, right, Malvo from the shooting out there in uh, the crime that happened in Mobile, Alabama. And then they're able to tie him to Muhammad, right? AKA John William, uh, John Allen Williams, formerly known, formerly his original name, and then which ended up becoming John Allen Muhammad. And then they found out that he had purchased a Bushmaster 223 rifle. And when you guys have, when you have a restraining order against you guys, you cannot have a firearm, okay? You become a prohibited person. It's the equivalent to having a gun as a felon or an illegal alien, et cetera. So they were able to go ahead and charge him with a federal weapons violations. Now, why is that important? Well, it allows them to go ahead and get an arrest warrant. And once you have an arrest warrant for someone, it's, you can put more resources into finding him. And now that you have an arrest warrant from you, you can actually arrest him once you pick him up, right? And on top of that, they went ahead and got a, a material witness uh, warrant for him. So I've done several material witness warrants, guys, in the past. And a material witness is someone that you can basically arrest, right? or detain them because they are the witness in a uh, federal investigation and they need to be brought in uh, because they have some kind of critical testimony to provide to the case. I used to do this often when I was an agent where if you caught a smuggler with like, let's say 10 illegal aliens, you needed those aliens to testify against the individual and they wouldn't have Fifth Amendment privileges because they weren't being charged for a crime. So you would hold them under material witness warrant so that they can be in the judicial system. Why would you do that? Well, because otherwise they would need to be deported. So the material witness affidavit that you file gets you in a material witness warrant, and then you're able to hold those individuals for the court. So this was very smart by the FBI. There's a chess move where they get the arrest warrant for Muhammad because they know he's uh, he has the firearms violations because he shouldn't have a gun now that he has a restraining order against him. And then since they were able to effectively tie him to Malvo, they get a material witness affidavit uh, warrant for Malvo because they didn't have charges on him at the time. Okay. So that was the strategy that the FBI employed at the time to get these guys in custody. And remember, guys, half the job is just getting them in custody. So it gives you time to go ahead and form and file formal charges against them later on. Like the video, by the way. You ain't going to get sauce like that nowhere else. <laughs> God damn it. Dumb, the Monko, Monko. That's the picture that they released to the ma to the mass media. I hope to God this is it, though. You know, you know I hope to God this is it. Too many people done died. Too many kids are scared. You know, my little girl last night when she prayed, she you know she thanked God and thanked her mother and father, and she said, "Lord, please get this sniper." Well, there's still a lot to cover in this story. I mean, there's a lot going on. God only knows what's going to happen next. In the end game, you can't predict it. That's what's so wild about this.
22 days, people were fixated on a white van. Now the search was on for a dark Chevrolet Caprice car. The man with New Jersey plates, right, is seen right here, guys, with the Beltway snipers. Meanwhile, October 22nd, we searched our criminal records database and found that Muhammad had registered a blue Chevy Caprice with the license plate of NDA 21Z in New Jersey. That description was given to the news media and shared far and wide. So this is one time where the media can actually do something to help the case versus hurt the case. And began. But every now and then you just need a little bit of luck. And maybe our luck was that they weren't and this is where the media can help once you actually have the individuals identified for real and you have their personal identifiers and or their vehicle then you go ahead and put it out to the media so that you can help so you got more eyes out there looking for these guys watching television that night as a result of what we found in tacoma washington uh, and of uh of identifying uh, those two people by name. And this is also the importance, guys, of having federal partners involved. They were able to go ahead and simultaneously conduct the search over the, in Tacoma, Washington, a whole other jurisdiction, right, to assist the Montgomery police who don't have the authority to conduct a law enforcement action in another state. This is where the feds come in handy. We did some record checks in our databases and found- Hey, shout out to ATF in the house. In Montgomery County area during the time <laughs> the shootings occurred. We got ATF in the house. Like the video. Yeah, like the goddamn video. Oh, <laughs> oh man. We got the feds in the house now, man. Heard. There was a uh, phone call from a uh, civilian uh, truck driver who was at a rest stop near Frederick, Maryland, who had heard the uh, license tag. We also have them boys here. And then we got the DA in the house as well. Shout out to y'all. <laughs> oh my God, bro. This is hilarious. How did I know y'all were going to do it right away? Then we got CIA in the house as well. <laughs> All these guys. Oh, even the Policia Federal Ministeria is in the fucking house. <laughs> Yo, number one chat, man. Y'all are hilarious, bro. He goes in and says, okay? <laughs> Yo, what the fuck, man? <laughs> the Maryland State Police then uh, took up that responsibility and they the blocked off the entrance too. and the exit. <laughs> I immediately um, uh, got in my car and headed towards Frederick, and I actually pulled out on the interstate directly behind the hostage rescue team that was en route to that location. And just so you guys know, HRT, a hostage rescue team, is the FBI's elite um, uh, extraction crew. Basically, they're, they're sent to most, the most high-risk stuff. They're probably the most elite SWAT team in the United States that's still law enforcement outside of the military. They're trained specifically by SEALs, uh, really good at what they do. The FBI agents that are in the H uh, S uh, HRT do that full-time. They, they're just sine qua non and they train all day. They're FBI agents, right, 1811s. But they don't carry any cases and they train 24 7 and they're deployed all over the country uh, for any type of crazy situation like this. Uh, I selected the. What's so funny, Edgy? What? <laughs> uh, just, they, they're just them going crazy in the chat? Yeah. The yeah, um, FBI's hostage rescue team, which is an elite uh, team that is rarely used um, to be the uh, a team that would make the assault. Authorize them to go forward and implement the plan. <laughs> I traveled forward to deploy the first team. Then the second team. A hundred officers surrounded the car. They smashed out the windows and took the sleeping suspects at gunpoint. Yep, they were there asleep. Imagine being wanted all over the, like literally like the most wanted people in the world. And you're like, ah, oh, you know what, bro? I know we've been watching the news, everything, and they just mentioned our names, but let's go to sleep. Like, bro, L. And everyone knew the car. Yeah, well. and everybody knew the car too. Like, why didn't y'all get the fuck out the car? <laughs> Stupid. 
the subjects were removed from the vehicle and secured. Uh, they were handcuffed and separated and um, uh, and cared for. Yeah, cared for. <laughs> Not the cap. Finally. After 22 days of murder and mayhem, Chief Moose and his investigators had the prime sniper suspects in custody. 41-year-old John Muhammad and 17-year-old Lee Malvo are not related. They met when Muhammad briefly dated Malvo's mother. Muhammad, a Gulf War veteran, received no sniper training, but earned the Army's expert marksmanship badge. Oh, translation. You don't miss. The sniper's car had been modified to allow them to shoot unseen from within. After capture, the press reported the killer's car had been stopped several times during the investigation. Oh, man. Yo, what the fuck, bro? <laughs> United States Marshal Service and I. Was Dumb, 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 yeah, so what the fuck, bro? My man said he's tired, too tired of uh, sitting in court. <laughs> and we also got the Department of Justice in the house as well, man. Shout out to, to them. Make sure to like the video, too. Yeah, like the video, Department of Justice. Shout out to y'all. <laughs> hit, the, hit the like button. Well, we got Secret Service in the house, too. Hit the like button before I expose you. I appreciate that, my friend. You guys are hilarious with these names, man. Dumb, 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 dumb. <laughs> There have been questions asked about um, a Chevy Caprice that was seen in the area of the Washington, D.C. shooting and why we didn't put out information about that vehicle. And I think the, the best reason for that is that we didn't have multiple witnesses seeing that vehicle in the area, and it wasn't a, sus a suspicious vehicle in that area, at least not to the point that we had a good enough description that we could um, get it out to the public and narrow down the field of, of um of vehicles that we were looking for. And as a matter of fact, the witness had the color wrong on it as well. Um, you know, in retrospect, knowing what we know now, it might have been helpful to put out that there was a Chevy Caprice in the area. After 13 shootings, the media waited for Chief Moose to confirm that the sniper was off the streets. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand by. <laughs> Sorry to keep everyone waiting tonight. The search of the vehicle this evening today yielded a weapon, which is a Bushmaster XM-15 223 caliber rifle, which was sent to the ATF lab in Rockville for analysis. The results of forensic testing are that the weapon seized from the vehicle occupied by Muhammad has been forensically determined to be the murder weapon in the shootings. The residents of Montgomery County, the Washington region, indeed our entire nation of profound thanks and deep appreciation to Montgomery County Police Chief Charles Moose, ATF Special Agent in Charge Mike Bouchard, FBI Special Agent in Charge Gary Ball. Yeah, there we go. So I knew I knew it. So these guys weren't actual case agents. These guys that you guys saw that were talking about talking in the documentary were the special agents in charge. So just so you guys understand the way it works is and I've broken down this, this in other situations, but the special agent in charge, also known as the SAC or the SAIC, as the FBI calls it, is the top guy in that agency. And he's the one. And I knew that as soon as he said, oh, yeah, I deployed the HRT. Uh, that pretty much tells me he's going to be the top guy. They're not the actual case agent. The case agent is uh, the special agent who basically runs the case. And then above him, you got a supervisor. Then above him, you got assistant special agent in charge. Then above him, you got the special agent in charge. And the manager's job is to get the case agent everything they need to make the, you know, to make the case happen. And then obviously the ATF was involved as well. So uh, they're the equivalent to like, let's say a sheriff or, you know, a police chief. They're the top brass in that agency and that local jurisdiction. You can see yourself standing there, but on the other hand, wouldn't hurt my feelings if I 
wake up one morning and couldn't remember anything about it, I wouldn't mind forgetting it. I will always wish we would have found them sooner because when you think about our victims and think about their families, we could have saved some of that pain. Since his arrest, Lee Malvo has told police that all the shootings were carried out jointly and he pulled the trigger on the boy. Allegedly, it is Malvo's writing in the letters, voice on the police tapes, and print found on the murder weapon. John Mohammed's ex-wife claims the shootings were a cover to kill her so he could reclaim his children. Both men are now awaiting separate trials in Virginia. They face death by lethal injection if found guilty of the crimes. This documentary came out a while ago, as you guys can see, but it's fresh because you, you can see the actual law enforcement officers that were involved, which is why I liked it. But we come to, came to find out later on, as you guys know, that um, Muhammad, John Muhammad, basically was uh, killed on, I think, November 10th, they said, by lethal injection. Yes, November 10, 2009, uh, in Greensville Correctional Center in, in Jarrett, Virginia. So, guys, that is a documentary right there, man. I really hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, oh, real quick. I wanted to show y'all. You didn't cover that much of the motive of everything. Oh, yeah, the motive. So, basically, the motive, guys, was they were trying to... Um, here, let me... What was the motive? From what I read, uh, yeah, here on, in, on Wikipedia. Here, let me... That go ahead. Muhammad wanted to kill his second wife. Right. And he wanted to cover up like doing the killings around the area where she lived. Mm. And then and, what, wait, and the on. other guy was just a terrorist. Like he was like, yeah, the, he he um, from what I read, it's like he wrote like some some stuff um, insinuating that he wanted to do like a jihad, a jihad against the United States. Yeah. It, it, and, yeah. and they. And they also had some other crazy cookmania plans, like they wanted to create terror and have the yeah, kids. Yeah, they wanted to kill. Raise, they wanted to take over the country and have the kids raised to be yeah. terrorists. Like a lot of these guys aren't logically sound. Make, a lot of the time, stupid. Yeah, they wanted to make like camps for kids to to be like terrorists. Killer, terrorists, and also they wanted to kill like pregnant women. They wanted to like a, the aim was like to kill pregnant women and six white males or six white people every every day. That was their their aim, but the thing is that yeah, it it got uh, I don't know how to say it, but they couldn't do it basically. Al terrorists, man, they didn't even have like a focused goal. Like, come on, man. Like, at least Bin Laden like had a, like I, I death to America. We're gonna do this because y'all have foreign policy in the Middle East that we don't like, and them boys are on the team, and y'all invaded Palestine. Like they had reasons, right? But these guys are just kind of all over the place. Like, yeah, we're just going to start sniping people randomly. You know what I mean? Like, uh, we just want people to hate America. Like, not focused at all, man. L terrorists. You have some, Angie? Oh, my God. Right, they just, just made ice. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, oh, no. so, guys, real quick. I'm going to show you out uh, the setup with the Caprice real fast, how how they had a setup and how they were able to get away with this for a while. Kind of an interesting situation. Um, and I'll show you some. Actually, you know what? Let me show you some crime scene photos of the Caprice. Here's the vehicle right here. Uh, let me enlarge it for y'all real fast. Hey, guys, oh, do me yeah. a favor. We got 2,000 likes. Maybe we can get it up to like, you know, 22, 2,500, man. They Let's open, get that engagement up. They open a hole in the car so yes. they can shoot from there. Yes. Crazy. So um, on the morning of October 24th, the hunt for the snipers quickly came to an end when a team of Maryland State Police and Montgomery County SWAT officers and special agents from our hostage rec rescue team arrested the sleeping John Allen Muhammad and Lee Boyd Malvo without a struggle. Just a few hours earlier at approximately 11.45 p.m., their dark blue 1990 Chevy Caprice with, with its New Jersey license plate had been spotted at a rest stop park parking lot off of I-70 in Maryland. Within the hour, law enforcement swarmed the scene, setting up a perimeter to check out any movements and make sure there'd be no escape. What evidence uh, experts from the FBI and other police forces found there was both revealing and shocking. The car had a hole cut in the trunk near the license plate so that shots could be fired from within the vehicle. It was, in effect, a rolling sniper's nest. So in the car, they found the Bushmaster 223 caliber rifle that had been used in each attack, a rifle scope for taking aim and a tripod to steady the shots, a back seat that had the seat metal removed between the passenger compartment and the trunk, enabling the shooter to get into the trunk from inside the car, the Chevy Caprice's owner's manual with the FBI laboratory, which the FBI laboratory detected, written impressions of one of the demand notes 
Um, so that's really cool that they were able to actually like you you they used it as the stabilizer to write the notes, and they were able to see that with the in the lab. Uh, the digital voice the digital voice recorder used by both Malvo and Muhammad to make extortion demands. A laptop stolen from one of the victims containing maps of the shooting sites and getaway routes from some of the crime scenes and maps, walkie talkies, and many more items. Okay, here's some you guys can see there's the hole right there that they had used. Yeah. Uh with the night New Jersey plate. And then here's the timeline uh, from October 2nd all the way to the 24th, which was outlined in the um, you can put documentary. This in, the, in, the, in, the, in the description, right? Uh, was that? Oh, yeah, I'll put this link in the description for them. Yeah, I should do that. Good call. Can you put, can you put that for yeah. them, Angie? Um, and then all, here is the Capri setup from a visual standpoint, guys. I don't think it has any sound. So, all right. So they got the guy sitting in there. Wow. They literally pimped the right. <laughs> yep. So you can lift that up and it allows the sniper to get into a comfortable lying position. Right. And obviously the trunk would be closed in this situation for the, but for the purpose of this demonstration, they're showing you what it looks like. And then, bam, you could close it, and you don't see anything besides a small little extension outside the hole. And that's how they were able to conduct the shootings without being caught for so long. So, pretty pretty smart tactic, and it kept them from being uh, caught for damn near a month. 23 days of terror, guys. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah. Angie, what are your thoughts on the case? It's funny, crazy. These guys are the, the most random terrorists. Like, they, I mean, how they got together, this, this guy just briefly day the mother of the other one. It's just, just crazy how they found, like, something in common between the two to do this thing. It's just crazy. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, so I'll, I'll go through some of these chats, by the way, real fast. Um, C. John, C. Johnny X goes, oh, so the FBI does have a profiling unit like the BAU Behavioral Analysis Unit from the show Criminal Minds that investigate serial killers and other things like this case. Uh, yeah, I didn't, I don't know where the BAU comes from, but yes, the FBI definitely does have uh, like a behavior profilers. Oops, sorry. That, uh, that was me. No, that's fine. That's, that's the Twisted link. Talks with Noah goes, love the channel as always, Myron and Angie. What was, has your communication been like with Tate since he is released and now he's holding up? He's doing well, guys. He's doing well. Uh, I've been talking with him. He's 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 uh, he's all right. Uh, Aria Walker, shout out to Andrew and Tristan. Uh, we love you, Angie. Shout Thank out to you. you. <laughs> uh, Ramin Hashemian goes. Can you do more shows on your career and your cases? I will. Um, Benny G, five bucks. Uh, Jay Villa goes. Marin, have you done a Feta podcast on the Colts Heaven's Gate? I have not. Uh, speaking of Colts, we got to do the Son of Sam as well for you guys. Uh, mm -hmm. Umar Yassin goes. I'm referring to a brand sponsorship. One of the brands I represent is interested. You know what? Do me a favor because Angie manages it. Hit fedit.1811 on Instagram. That way it won't be a spam. There's Unplug Fit and Fresh and Fit Podcast on Instagram. And uh, we'll check it out. Uh, thank you, Omar. And if the numbers make sense, we'll think about it. Uh, I'm Ahmad. I love you, Lord Myron of Miami. Marriage caused divorce. If I was a female, I would for sure shoot my <laughs> shot. Uh, pause. Appreciate that, bro. <laughs> Myron, we need El Chapo ASAP. Yes, I'll do it, El Chapo. But that, again, oh, is going to have to be a series. That's highly when, requested as yes, well. Yes, when we do the Mexican cartels, mm -hmm. that's going to be a series. Them boys CIA, we here. Okay. Uh, Natalie E goes, I love catching these Fed at Lives. It feels like a big group of hilarious guys hanging out, having fun, watching true crime. Absolutely. I really enjoy the lives for that purposes too. Me didn't need to be on the police payroll. Uh, we named first, and that's for BBC News. Yo, y'all hilarious, bro. What the fuck, man? <laughs> Top flight security. Someone need my help? Okay. Appreciate that. Secret service. I'm the most unsecret service of them all. Okay. Uh, Ryoko goes, by the way, I tip that led to them was that a few people left the highway stop and when they left they saw the vehicle found it weird and called it in the sniper didn't shoot because it was a hiding spot okay fair enough um secret service again i'm the most unsecret service of them all appreciate that uh south carolina police dispatcher from alex <laughs> what the fuck bro remember that the fucking lady didn't yeah. know what the fuck was going on go back and watch our murder case guys. Hey, that was actually Don't funny as hell if they called me i would have handled it on the spot no you would have bro you were trash no. too we're in this bitch myron Feel free to call us any, anytime. Shout See out to you, Miami Police Department. Yeah, I didn't help when I needed y'all, though. Uh, Oops, and then, yes, this is sorry. the link, by the way, guys, for y'all that want to go ahead and get the uh, Beltway Snipers. I'll put that in the description for you guys. Hey, yo, Myron, you owe us some money. No, I don't. Uh, Zena the Witch, someone better make a Masada account. Someone already did. <laughs> so, um, 
What else here? Anything else that that we got? Uh, they were caught up. So yeah. Y'all are hilarious with these accounts, by the way. We got ICE in the house as well. NSA in the house. I'll, I'll give oh, y'all. Yeah. I see you guys coming in here. I see, yeah. Military police, <laughs> ICE, Navy SEALs. Policia, uh, Policia Federal. Yeah, Ministerial. these guys. <laughs> NSA in the house. Yeah, y'all are hilarious, bro. Um, <laughs> you asked for it and they delivered. Yeah, this they, they, yeah y'all made literally a million accounts um, <laughs> immediately. U.S. Marshals, the one that made another U.S. Marshals one. I'll give y'all wrenches. Y'all better not fuck it up, though, if I give you guys these wrenches. KGB in the house now. Imposter. You guys are fucking Oh, funny. we got another shit. CPS. Uh, Blink Dark Mellow goes, Wonderful content is always mine. I bought your book and read it in one day. I can see why is it a bestseller on Amazon. Why women deserve less. You're the best. Thanks again. W Chat, W Angie as well. Yes, guys, the book is definitely in stores. Why women deserve less. Go ahead and get it, man. I appreciate that. Uh, Chloe Whitstead. Our white's head, white head goes, you guys are hilarious and always informative. Thank you, Myron and Angie. We got y'all, man. Uh, I think yeah. that, uh, what are your last thoughts on this one, Angie? I already said that. I was just, you don't have anything just, else? No, I just find it crazy. But you guys follow up the Instagram at Ferry.1811 and like the video and subscribe to the channel, please. We just hit like 150,000 subscribers. <laughs> Marco, I appreciate that. We need that. to get you to 200, so you guys, uh, before the end of the year. Yes. That's, that's the goal. Let's hit 200K, guys. Yeah. Um, Guys, I think that's pretty much it. That covers the, the DC snipers. Uh, like the video, man, on your way out. We're at 2.1K. If you guys get us to 2,500, I really appreciate that. Um, And, yeah, this video is probably going to be uh, demonetized to a degree because of uh, the, the violence and terrorism and, you know, your guys' shit in the chat, <laughs> which is hilarious. But, um. <clears throat> But yeah, man, I appreciate you guys. Love you guys. We'll catch you guys tomorrow for Money Monday. We're going to have uh, Money Burger in the house with Brandon Carter. We're going to have Aaron Clary. And we're going to have an after hours. We're going to be a three-peat for you guys tomorrow. There's a reason why we're number one, God damn it. <laughs> do we're working you gonna hard. Have, you guys are gonna Someone have said Aaron Green Clary? River Killer. Yeah, we already have an episode on the Green River Killer. Go back to the playlist that I have. Matter of fact, I'll go ahead and show it for you um, if you guys want. Right, You go to the channel here. Right Here it is. And you're just going to go into the serial killer playlist right here. And you will see the Green River Killer is right here, as well as all the other people. And we got the Mafia as well. We'll probably, we might, uh, me and Angie probably will film another episode for y'all for Thursday's yeah, yeah, yeah. video with the Banano Crime Family. I think will be the next one. But uh, yeah, man, like the video, guys. Love y'all. Um, 3P coming tomorrow. And uh, yeah, catch you guys on the next one man and w shout out to the department of justice and all you uh guys <laughs> dea and all the three letter agencies that invaded the chat um <laughs> <laughs> we got you yeah y'all are funny man um you guys keep asking for um cases um that Mario had already covered so i would suggest you to check the playlist that he already made so you guys you know you have the cases there okay yeah, yeah, because a lot of keep, cases. Yeah, you keep texting me like, yeah, and you where is like the serial killer and and this and that, and we already covered those cases. Well, Myron did. Yeah, Brian Cobra here is a highly requested one, and Myron already covered that case. So, yeah, yeah man, you guys so, check it out. So yeah, go back. We got the playlist organized for y'all. They're all there, man. I covered. We have probably covered a case that you want requested. So especially if it's a really big famous one. Um, but yeah, mafia episode coming uh, soon. We'll catch you guys on the next one. Love y'all. Don't forget to like the video on your way out, of course. And I'll see you guys on the next one. Peace. Peace. I was a special agent with Homeland Security Investigations, okay, guys? HSI. The cases that I did mostly were human smuggling and drug trafficking. No one else has these documents, by the way. Here's what FedEx covers. Dr. Lafredo confirmed lacerations due to stepping on glass. Murder investigation. You see him reaching in his jacket. You don't know... And he's positioning been on February 13, 2019. You're facing two counts of premeditated murder. Racketeering and Rico conspiracy. Young, young slime life here and after referred to as YSL. The defendant's uh,